So allow yourself to get comfortable. Take a moment to close your eyes. And begin to drift comfortably asleep. And as you drift comfortably asleep, I'll tell this story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift comfortably asleep faster to the sound of my voice or the spaces between my words. But as you listen along to this story, you can just begin to drift off asleep. And you can have a sense of the cat that's walking in the warmth of an Egyptian desert. It's walking on that warm sand, feeling that heat on its fur. and being aware of how comfortable it is with the warmth. Walking with confidence, with grace. Looking around, seeing pyramids off in the distance. Seeing the Nile. And the cat decides to walk towards the Nile. And its feet sink gently into the sand with each step it takes. You can hear sounds in the background. The occasional sound of birds overhead. As it walks over to the Nile, and the closer it gets to the Nile, the more it can begin to hear sounds of people milling around the river, working, fishing, talking to each other, and as it arrives at the Nile, so it has a drink of the water, dunks its head a little bit into the water, cools itself off a little bit, shakes its head, shaking some of that water off, rubs its face, and then confidently walks along a wooden path and up onto a boat and up on the boat it starts exploring it sees barrels at the front you can notice the sails currently furled up people milling around on the boat. And it walks into a cabin near the back of the boat. And the boat begins to move away from the shore. And as the boat moves away from the shore and follows the Nile towards the sea. So the cat decides to take a moment to curl up in a comfortable space and just rest for a moment. And as the cat begins to rest so the boat travels down the Nile and out towards the sea. And while it's traveling along, so the sun begins to set. 
and the Nile begins to take on an orangey glow to the surface of the water. And dragonfly hunting above the water, darting left and right, hovering, moving around with incredible maneuverability, moving each wing independently. And birds overhead, sound of an eagle, somewhere high up in the sky. A row of camels with people on them, setting off into the desert, perhaps heading off somewhere to set up camp in the desert and go on a long journey as that boat continues along the Nile. And while that boat continues and heads out to sea, so that cat drifts deeper and more relaxed asleep. And while it drifts deeper and more relaxed asleep, so it begins to imagine itself in a completely different place and time, finding itself creeping and crawling through long grass with a gentle mist across the surface of that grass. At night time, with moon and stars in the sky, heading through long grass and then into a forest and entering that forest and seeing flying, glowing animals with little twinkles of green light, almost like they're turning on and off, communicating with each other. And the cat walks into the, this mysterious, magical forest. And is aware that its footsteps sound and feel totally different to when it walks in a desert. That it feels totally different to be in this environment at night time compared to the environment in a desert. And as it follows a mud trail deep into the forest, so it can hear the rustling of the leaves in the breeze. It can hear sounds of birds walking around on the forest floor and other animals and the moonlight shines through the canopy sending shards of white light dancing and sparkling in the path ahead and beyond the sparkling light the cat notices what at first it thinks like a humpless camel and as it gets closer it notices this most beautiful almost glowing white unicorn and in awe the cat begins to walk towards that unicorn And the unicorn is just tapping one of its front legs, one of its front hooves on the ground, eating some plants on the ground. 
having to be careful with not knocking its horn on the ground and on trees. And as the cat gets closer to the unicorn, so the unicorn leans down its front legs, lets the cat climb up onto its back and then stands back up again. And the cat stands tall and confident, balancing on the back of the unicorn as it walks its way out of the forest following the path towards a lake and the unicorn and the cat almost seem to have some kind of a psychic connection almost seem like they developed a friendship at first sight and as the unicorn gets out into the clearing toward the lake. So it begins to sparkle and glow and bright white light begins to emanate from its sides. And two pure white wings begin to form out of the sides of the unicorn. And these large white wings, almost like wings of a dove. And the unicorn flaps those wings, makes a neighing kind of sound. Bends down slightly and then launches itself up into the air. And the cat suddenly doesn't feel quite so confident and decides to sit itself down and hold on tight. As the unicorn seems to be galloping through the sky on a rainbow leaving behind this rainbow of light, almost created by its galloping. And the cat can't work out whether the rainbow is being created first and the unicorn's galloping on the rainbow, or whether the unicorn's galloping is what's creating the rainbow. And the unicorn seems to be having so much fun, swooping down, speeding up, circling round. And after a while, the cat realizes that they can trust the unicorn and they begin to relax into the experience. And they relax into the uncertainty of the experience. And once the cat relaxes into the experience, so the unicorn begins to take them on a journey of discovery. It begins to gallop up towards some white fluffy clouds in the sky that almost look like cotton in the sky. And as it arrives at those clouds, so the cat notices that high up on those clouds is some kind of a palace. Almost like there's some kind of land up here in the clouds. And the unicorn walks onto the clouds leans down, lets the cat climb off onto the clouds. And the way the unicorn does it, just gives the cat the confidence and the trust that it's not gonna just fall straight through those clouds. And so the cat jumps down onto the floor 
onto those clouds. and finds that it's like walking on cushions. It's so fluffy and soft. And the cat rolls on its back, stretches itself around, twists its lower body and its shoulders, pushes its face into the fluffy clouds, and then begins to almost skip its way towards the palace. And as the cat nears the palace, so it notices that there's a small lake and there's a moat around the palace and a bridge between the cat and the palace. And the cat walks over that bridge and as it does, it looks down into the water and down in the water. It can see holes, almost like the water is in a sieve. And the cat wonders if this is how rain is made. And the cat heads into the palace. And inside the palace, its claws seem to tap on a marble surface and echo around the inside of this palace. And the cat climbs some steps, walks across the softest, most beautiful rug and sees on the back wall in this palace, a picture. And it's a picture of the ocean that's obviously been painted from a cliff. And the cat walks up to that picture and thinks there's something wrong with its eyes because the picture seems to be slightly out of focus. And so the cat tries to get focus on that picture. And then the cat realizes that there's nothing wrong with their eyes. This picture's vibrating. And so the cat reaches forward with its nose to buff that painting. But as it does, its head passes straight through the painting and so it decides to step all the way and the cat steps through that painting finding itself on a cliff hearing crashing waves below seeing a lighthouse off in the distance along that cliff and turning round and seeing the picture frame and through the picture frame is the inside of the palace. And the cat walks to the edge of the cliff, looks over the edge of the cliff, down at the rocks, at the white horses, at the way the sea is crashing against the cliff and on the rocks. And down there, on those rocks, the cat sees a turtle on the shore. And so it finds its way down. Heading down a, a narrow path down that cliff. And the further down the cliff the cat goes, the more sea spray lands on the cat, the more the cat can smell that salty air. And the cat gets down to the turtle 
and walks over to that turtle. And near the turtle, a woman suddenly walks out of a cave and walks over to the turtle, pets the turtle's head as the turtle lowers its head to her. And the cat's curious about this woman, who she is, where she's from. And so the cat goes to investigate with curiosity. And the woman crouches down and reaches out. The cat climbs into her arms, never one to turn down, being petted. And the woman strokes the cat and holds the cat in her arms. And the cat rolls onto its back. And she tickles and scratches its belly. And the cat purrs in her arms. And she can feel that purring reverberating through her arms. Almost like it's reverberating into her soul. And she's never seen a cat before. And she finds the feeling of the animal unusual. She's never felt fur before like this. And she climbs onto the turtle. And she sits the cat on the turtle in front of her. And she holds that cat. And she closes her eyes. And the turtle pushes itself into the water and begins to dive. And the cat's unsure of the experience and then notices that the woman with her eyes closed seems to be creating an energy between her hands that creates an air bubble around that cat. Almost like the cat's in a submarine on the back of a turtle. Being held in a woman's hands. And then as that turtle dives faster and faster. So the woman's legs. Slip from beside the turtle. To stretching out behind her. And then they begin to turn into a tail. And the cat's looking back from inside its submarine, inside its air bubble, on a turtle's back. At what's happening to this woman who's so calmly resting her hands around that cat. With her legs now becoming a green tail. That she begins to move up and down. Swimming in time with the turtle. Her hair flowing in the water. As she smiles down at the cat. And the cat thinks this is the most unusual experience, and yet exciting, and an adventure. And the turtle and the woman and the cat dive all the way down to what looks like a crystal palace under the water that's almost see-through. And they dive down to that palace, swim into that palace. And then in that palace, 
suddenly they enter a part where the water seems to drain away. The woman gets her legs back. They just seem to start appearing again. And the cat is dry and steps off that turtle's back. Curious about where they are. And the woman starts talking to the cat. Explaining to the cat. That it needed to learn something from its adventure, from this whole journey. Something about bravery, about going with uncertainty, being comfortable with uncertainty, and trusting those around them, and that they'll need this knowledge they just don't know when yet. And the cat's kind of listening, but busy curiously exploring this crystal palace. Then after a while, the cat sees that there's somewhere to lie down here. It lies down closes its eyes and begins to drift asleep. And as that cat begins to drift asleep in this palace, it starts to wake up on that boat. And the cat can hear the crew on the boat and can feel the rocking of that boat. and is aware it's back on the boat that it started dreaming on. And the cat was curious about the fact that the dream felt so real, more real than its dreams normally feel, and more unusual than its dreams normally are. Normally, the cat thinks to itself that it drifts into a dream and dreams about chasing a mouse and catching and playing with a mouse, and then letting it go, and then it normally wakes up. And yet, this was like no dream it had ever had before. And the cat walked out onto the deck of the boat, and could see that the boat was entering stormy waters, and that the boat was now far away from the Nile. And the cat wondered how long they'd been asleep for. And the crew were trying to keep control of the boat in the stormy waters. And the cat could see a reasonably large incandescent beetle hanging onto a rope almost as if that beetle was worried about being thrown overboard and the cat went over and grabbed the bit of rope and pulled the rope tight and let the beetle crawl down the rope and crawl onto its back And then the cat, sliding across the deck, trying to keep control of itself, found its way back into the cabin of the boat, crouched down and let that beetle go in the cabin, and hunker down safely in the cabin. And then the cat went back out onto the deck of the boat, and did it in its own way, some help for the crew, trying to pull on rope, 
trying to alert crew to things they needed to be aware of. And then the most unusual thing happened. A penguin leapt from the water, startling the crew landing on its belly on the boat. And in the water could be seen the fins of some orca whale. And those killer whale just started circling the boat. And the penguin seemed to be scared of those killer whale. And yet the killer whale weren't actually any kind of threat to the boat or the people on the boat. They seemed to be trying to help to stabilize the boat and help to keep the boat on track through the storm. But the penguin thought it best to sit on the boat while the killer whale were around. And the crew, being from Egypt, were totally confused at this sight. And then after a while, the storm began to pass. And the night sky began to return. Stars were visible again in the sky. The water calmed. The crew seemed to relax. The killer whales broke off and headed off into the distance. The crew sat down and rested. And the cat and the penguin investigated each other before the penguin leapt back over the side and the cat went back into that cabin and decided that it's more peaceful to be asleep. It's less hectic. And so it took a moment to drift off asleep. And the next time it awoke, the boat was back in the river. And so the cat got off the boat found its way home, settled down in its usual bed. And drifted and relaxed, asleep. So as you listen to this sleep story, you can just take a moment to get yourself comfortable to close your eyes and as you rest there with your eyes closed so I'll tell this story in the background and as I tell this story in the background you can just drift and relax comfortably asleep and there was a woman out in space with her crew on a spaceship and they were hurtling through space, heading towards a habitable planet that was discovered. And this woman had decided she wanted to be one of the first to visit an alien world. And from Earth, they didn't know what this planet would be like. Only the chemical composition of the planet, that it had an atmosphere, that the atmosphere was breathable. 
that it was about the same kind of size as Earth. And that because the atmosphere has oxygen in, there's a chance there might be life on this planet. And the journey was a long one. But they developed technology to be able to get around the speed limit of light. And although this way around the speed limit of light allowed them to physically travel faster than light from point A to point B, it didn't allow them to communicate faster than light. Communication could only be sent while travelling slower than the speed of light. And so it's still going to take a few years for the ship to arrive at that planet. And now the ship is nearing its destination. And this woman and the rest of her crew are preparing for what may lay ahead. They're looking at what the planet looks like from distance, recognizing the familiarity of this nearing star in the sky, how familiar it looks to the sun, and the spacecraft has been traveling while spinning to create artificial gravity, and now the spacecraft is slowing and preparing to go into orbit around the planet. And the spacecraft doesn't have any windows. It uses cameras on the exterior of the craft and then monitors inside the craft so that they can look at the monitors. And as the craft starts to go into orbit around the planet, before anyone heads down to the planet, the craft is going to orbit the planet for a few weeks, orbiting about once every 90 minutes or so, to scan the planet close up, take photos of the planet in great detail, and then work out the best place to take a landing party down to the planet. And so after a few weeks of orbiting and gazing down on that planet and studying images of the planet, the team finds out that the planet is largely overrun with plant life, that there are animals down there but it's largely overrun with plant life. But they also find that there are signs that once a civilization was here, that there are ruins of a civilization that are now all overrun by plants, that something's obviously happened that's ended that civilization with advanced technology. And everything checked out on the planet, that it's safe to go down there. That it's safe to explore. And so they were curious to send a landing party down. To explore some of the ruins. And a landing party go down to explore the ruins. And the woman takes the lead as she walks along what seems like it was perhaps a road. There's very little of it left now as plants have reclaimed the land. And she couldn't be sure because she doesn't know exactly how these plants grow compared to plants on earth. 
but she worked out that it seemed like plant life had been growing over these ruins for at least a few thousand years and that the plant life had made it very difficult to be able to clearly make out what's what but it also held the soil in place and made it so that in this area things were a bit more visible than they perhaps would be if soil or sand or something could flood over or blow over and cover it all up and she thought to herself about how recent that is how although it sounds like a long time in the past it's actually very recent very recent that another civilization was in reach of the earth and that had the earth got technology perhaps five or ten thousand years earlier maybe the two civilizations would have interacted and discovered each other but at the time this civilization was active humans on earth were still just forming communities and starting to think about the idea of farming and they explored these ruins and these ruins were near some mountains they could hear the sounds of animals, sounds almost like the sounds of familiar birds, the sounds of the rustling leaves as wind blew through the plants that seemed like trees, that everything seemed surprisingly familiar, that there were what looked like trees, there were what looked like familiar flowering plants. There were what looked like insects that were familiar. And birds and flying animals. And they were curious about how all of this life has sprung up to look so familiar to life on earth. That under these conditions on this planet that must have been very similar to various conditions on earth different life found its niche in the same way that life has found its niche on earth that there are small animals and larger animals flying animals animals of all kinds and everything just seemed so familiar and they followed this path and realized it was curving around towards the mountains and they kept following it round and round until it seemed to stop at the mountains and near where it stopped there were ruins on either side totally overrun, with roots passing through everything, the roots essentially turning everything to rubble. But the woman was fascinated by something that she could see just lying on the ground near a tree. It looked like a painting and it was in what looked like a plastic or some other kind of material container as if it was designed to be preserved and the woman and her team analysed this painting and identified that it definitely was a painting and it looked like a painting of this mountain range and what looked a bit like a family 
enjoying a holiday here. And the painting looked so familiar. And yet the family didn't look familiar. And the woman was excited at seeing what these aliens looked like that once existed, that must have had hobbies as mundane as anything done on earth. Just sitting painting your family and the landscape while they're on holiday. And the woman was curious as to why this random, well-preserved painting was lying here, near the mountains, in some kind of container obviously designed to preserve it. And as the woman and her team explored the side of the mountain, there was an unusually flat section of the mountain. And they were trying to figure out why the road led right up to the mountain and just stopped. And it looked like at some point, much of this side of the mountain had gradually begun to wear away and collapse and turn to rubble. But this very flat part was sticking out from all that. And the woman started exploring this flat part of the mountain, running her hand across it. When all of a sudden, somehow she triggered something. And there was a rumble. And the flat part lowered down into the ground. Revealing a tunnel going deep into that mountain. And the woman and her team documented everything. They placed a relay communication device outside the entrance to this tunnel. In case there was a problem with signalling, then the signal would pass down the tunnel to the relay device. A beam from the relay device back to the landing party ship and up to the ship in orbit. And they walked down the tunnel, could hear the echoing of their footsteps as they walked. And as they walked, suddenly lights started turning on around them. And they noticed what good condition this tunnel was in that it looked like no one had been in this tunnel and the elements hadn't got to this tunnel in all the time since that entrance was sealed. And they followed this path deeper and deeper into the mountain, hearing their echoey footsteps as they walked. And then off in the distance they could hear sounds coming from deep in the mountain. And so they walked towards those sounds. And the closer they got, the more they realised it sounded like speech. Like people talking and laughing and playing. It sounded like as you find yourself near a city and start to hear the distant hustle and bustle of a city. And after quite a while of walking, the tunnel opened up into a huge cave buried deep within the mountain. And what looked like a vast underground city and the woman and the other astronauts could tell that this city was somehow being powered that it was full of life there was animals there was intelligent beings behaving just like 
humans on earth behave. And someone approached them with a sense of curiosity as to who these people are. And in an unknown language, they spoke to the woman. And she responded, saying who she was and where she was from. And they didn't understand each other. And so they drew a picture of the earth, of the planet, of the stars around those areas. And still none of that seemed familiar to them here. And these people seemed incredibly friendly and welcoming. And the woman was curious how they were going to communicate with this race of people. And so they got out a computer device that had a program on it for recognising patterns that was designed just in case anyone ever encountered a pattern that seemed to be coming from an advanced civilization. And in human trials on Earth, the program had managed to translate different languages, recognizing them as languages, and then convert the patterns and translate it into another desired language. But its main function was to detect patterns beamed across space. But the woman turned on the device, picked up the sounds of the aliens talking. And as the aliens talked, so the computer program recognised patterns within the speech. And was able to then convert that into the closest that it would be in the woman's own language so that she could understand them and then it was able to be used like a translator that she could then talk and that would be converted back so that the computer speaks in their language and from this two-way communication through the computer the woman found out that that a disaster was about to happen to this civilization thousands of years beforehand. And they knew that they had to save themselves. And so they created communities underground in mountain ranges that would protect them from a solar storm that was due to strike the planet, caused by a reasonably nearby exploding star. And they knew when it was going to happen, roughly. And so they built these huge communities underground. They figured out how to make it sustainable how to get all their energy from the core of the planet. And then generation after generation, they've lived down here. And they lived down here so long, within these communities, with no way of being able to test what's happened with the rest of the planet. whether the planet has recovered from that dose of radiation, whether life survived it, and they remain down here, and then forgot as generations and generations passed by. how to 
use some of the advanced technologies that they'd had, including how to open the doors from the inside. And most of the people down here had forgotten all about the doors and opening the doors. I'd got so used to living in this community down here, where cities underground are connected by various means around the thousands of miles of mountain ranges and they all have such a good life down here but they had to take a step back in their technological advancement and they all have led such a good life down here enjoying the life they've got here but not wanting to expose anyone to any risk and so not wanting to figure out a way to leave they've just accepted the environment they're in and the woman explained that the radiation has gone back to normal levels that life survived and thrived that life always finds a way and that if they want, they can always make a life for themselves back out on the planet. And that they can now have the help and support of another planet, the Earth. That humans from Earth are always willing to help others, to show kindness and compassion. And so, for the first time, they introduce these aliens who've never ever seen outside the mountains on their own planet to the world outside that were last seen by this alien race thousands of years earlier with the aliens that decided to shut themselves away in the mountains. And this alien race were incredibly grateful. And the woman knows they'll be all working together to help that civilization to build back outside the mountains in harmony with the natural world on this planet. And they share records of their past, of thousands of years of history, of a time before entering the mountains. And the woman and the other astronauts go back to their ship and launch up into space. Rendezvous with the ship in orbit and then start their journey back home to Earth with a tale that'll be exciting to tell to their families and to humanity back on their home planet. And they settle in for the long journey and drift and relax asleep while the ship starts that journey home. And as you get comfortable, you can let your eyes close. And with your eyes closed, you can listen to the sound of my voice. And while you're listening to the sound of my voice in the background, I'm just going to tell you a story. And as you listen along, you can begin to drift off asleep. And I don't know whether you'll drift off asleep faster with the sound of my voice, 
or perhaps with the spaces between my words. And as you drift comfortably asleep and relax there, you can just imagine someone lying in a meadow and they're lying down on the grass. It's night time. The sun has recently set. And they're gazing up at the sky, noticing the twinkling of the stars, noticing how more stars are appearing as their eyes adjust to the dark. Noticing as they gaze up the occasional shooting star that almost seems to fizz and pop and how different shooting stars seem to be subtly different colours some perhaps slightly more red others a little bit green some maybe with more of a blue tinge to them and as they rest there, they can feel the cool grass beneath them. They can feel that tickling of the grass as the most subtle breeze blows on the grass by their hands. They can feel the sensation of the air passing in their nose and out as they just experience being in the moment gazing up at the sky and as they continue to relax there so the moon starts rising low on the horizon at first with a, a red tinge looking large on the horizon and they just have a sense of that and can see it at the corner of their eyes and can notice how that moon is rising slowly up into the sky and as they lie there with their eyes closed they begin to drift inside their mind feeling so peaceful and they just allow whatever thoughts come to mind to just occur to them and they start hearing that sound of a, a warm, crackling fire on a cold winter's day. And that sound of the warm, crackling fire gets louder and they start to feel the warmth from that crackling fire. and then begin to notice themselves sitting in the most comfortable armchair with a cat resting on their lap purring away shadows dancing around the room soft lighting in the corners feeling so calm and they notice a book on the table beside them it's a book about space and they don't really feel in the mood to read but they pick the book up and they just start slowly 
turning the pages, just looking at the pictures while they feel the warmth of the fire and they imagine what it'd be like to go to the stars to see the nebulae to see different planets and it brought back memories of being a child and having that first time looking through a telescope at Saturn and having all of your attention on what you can see through the eyepiece where you notice a hazy slightly moving Saturn drifting across the field of view and find it so awe-inspiring that you almost feel like you could be floating in space and then after a little while the cat climbed down from their lap and they walked across the room they added another log to the fire and the crackles that made before going making themselves a, a hot chocolate coming back sitting down enjoying that chocolate and they had this feeling that something important was about to happen and they didn't know what And as they continue to just relax on this evening by the fire, they listened to that crackling. They saw the cat rest on the mat in front of the fire, having the warmest seat in the house. And as the fire burnt down to embers, it was just the most subtle glow. And they went to bed and drifted asleep. And in their dream, they found themselves on an old steam train. And they were traveling out through a savannah. They were heading out to the middle of nowhere for a safari. And the train pulled into a station. What looked to them like a really old fashioned station, like trains don't stop here often. They got off the train, walked down to a nearby river bank, noticing as they walked onto a jetty how their footsteps changed and now echoed on that wood. And they boarded a paddle steamer that was a first for them. And they just enjoyed that leisurely trip down the river. And they could see crocodile in the water, just floating there. They could see some plant life but it was turning more just to grasses the further they traveled. And after some time, as the sun rose, passed across the sky and began to set, they finally arrived at their destination. 
they left the boat, left all the other people and walked out into the middle of nowhere. And they found the most beautiful old tree out here. And they set up what was like a hanging tent up among the branches. And they lit themselves a campfire, had themselves some food before climbing up into their tent. Where they could see the Milky Way arched overhead. And were surprised by the darkness out here. How inky the sky looked. And the next morning, after grabbing themselves some breakfast on their campfire, they got themselves a map that they'd brought with them. They were here to find something. And they set off following that map. And after a while, they came across some old ruins they were searching for. And they started exploring around those ruins. And nature had begun to reclaim them. And in one of the ruins, they started hunting for an entrance. They knew there was supposed to be an entrance here somewhere and they'd hoped it hadn't previously been found. And they eventually found just a subtle change in the look of the grass that let them know that the dirt in that area had a different moisture level and that beneath that area must be the old entrance. And so they dug that area out and found a hidden tunnel. And they got out their torch and entered the tunnel and noticed how it was cooler down here in the tunnel than outside. And the light seemed to get absorbed into the tunnel walls. And each footstep echoed. And after just a little while, they came to a point where there was an actual door and they pushed the door open and saw some steps. They shone the torch down the tunnel, down those steps. And it looked like they were going to have to hold on to each side as they descended, so they wouldn't be able to hold the torch. So they shone the torch down there counted the number of steps and saw that there were 20 steps down to the next level. So they put the torch away, held onto the sides and started to descend, counting to themselves as they went on step 20, 19, 18, going deeper and deeper, 17, 16, 
15, 14, going all the way down those steps, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, and they continued all the way, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and they could hear the echoes of their footsteps coming from below them, 3, 2, 1, and they stepped down finally into the lower tunnel, got their torch out again, turned their torch on, and started to explore down here. And what they found was that they were now in a maze, and there was nothing on their map that told them the route through this maze. And so they got out some string, attached it near the steps, and started walking down the different passages of the maze. And every time they discovered a dead end, they would just backtrack with the string and then take a different route. And they knew there would be something like a maze down here because of what it is that they're searching for. And so they continued exploring, taking one route and then another. each time having to backtrack with the string and then unwind that string again down a different path until eventually they found a large opening into a huge underground hall and in this underground hall as they shone their torch around the walls, everywhere their light shone, the walls sparkled, shimmered, and reflected the light around. And they walked over to the walls. And they found that the walls were covered in crystals. reflecting that light everywhere. And it helped to give this chamber a comfortable glow. And they were surprised that as they moved their torch around, there were certain points where light would seem to reflect in a more direct path. And they got the angle just right, almost like shining a laser pointer at some mirrors, that their torchlight bounced around the chamber and illuminated one point on the back wall And they walked over to that point on the back wall. And they saw a stone with some symbols on it. And they slid that stone aside. And the other side of the stone, they found the most beautiful, pink, almost glowing crystal 
And they reached in and they took hold of that crystal. And just as they did, they felt the most profound sense of deep calm, relaxation and well-being. That kind of calmness that someone can have from waking from the most beautiful sleep. or deep relaxation. That kind of calmness that almost tingles through you. From the top of your head all the way through to the tips of your toes. And they started to gain some insights, almost like that crystal somehow is containing knowledge that's triggered by touch. And they started absorbing that knowledge and realizing it's knowledge from an ancient civilization. Knowledge about the universe, about our place in the universe, and about where this civilization came from. Not where it came from on Earth, but where it came from in outer space. And they took that crystal with them and left the chamber and left the maze. And they found their way back to their tent. And as they rested in their tent, feeling that tent just lightly rocking in the tree, with a slight breeze on the sides, they gazed up into the sky. They looked at the constellations. And they began to understand their part in it all, their place within the story of this civilization. And as they drifted off asleep, so they began to dream that knowledge and wisdom. And the person who'd gone to bed awoke in the morning feeling like he'd had the most profound insight that he learned something in his dream that was connected to his reality. And he went out of his cabin he walked out into snowy outdoors breathed in that cold outdoor air took in some of that nature his cat ran out and jumped in the snow as well, before running back in and going by the fire. And then they went back in, sat back down in that comfortable chair, and relaxed back in front of their fire. Was that person there lying back on that really cool and comfortable grass under the most beautiful night sky could feel the light of the moon on their face as the moon reached high overhead now.
And so they decided to walk home on this beautiful evening. Where they went indoors, went up to bed. And settled down and drifted so peacefully and so comfortably asleep. So while you listen to this, just take a moment to get yourself comfortable, let your eyes close, and begin to comfortably relax asleep as I tell this story in the background. And you can have a sense of lying down on a warm desert island. You've got the sea lapping on the shore, the sound of the waves. Warmth of the sun on your face. The smell of the salty air. And I don't know whether there are some wispy clouds or other clouds in the sky, or whether the sky is just clear and blue as you relax there on that desert island. And while you relax there, you can hear some sounds around you. And you have this sense that there are some birds in the trees. And you can hear different bird calls. And lie there just feeling so relaxed. At the sound of those birds in the background. The rhythmic sound of the waves lapping on the shore. The warmth of the sun on your face. And you can begin to notice how the breathing slows down with the waves. And relaxation seems to spread through the body with the warmth of the sun. And while lying there, relaxing, drifting, dreaming, floating deeper and deeper asleep. You begin to have this sense of drifting into a dream. Drifting into a dream where you find yourself as an owl perched high in a tree. And you notice how, as an owl, everything you can see and hear has changed slightly. Your vision seems to be enhanced. Your hearing seems to be enhanced. And you seem to be able to make it directional by pointing it where you look. And as an owl, resting in the tree, gazing over the land, you start to realise that you're actually quite wise. That you've got a lot of knowledge, and yet you can be very quiet. And by being quiet, people don't realise how much knowledge you actually have. And you don't know what this dream means. But you know that you can follow the dream to find out. And as this owl, you just rest there in the tree. Listening to sounds around you, rustling leaves. Sounds of different animals and birds.
seeing birds flying in the sky. And you just walk along the trunk of the tree. Walking along the bark of that branch. And as you head from the trunk along the branch, you can see more of the land around you as you move closer to the edge of the tree. And when you reach the edge of the tree, you launch yourself off that tree, spread your wings, catch an updraft of warm air, and fly up into the sky and start circling and you circle your way round and up and round occasionally flapping your wings circling and rising and as you circle and rise higher and higher you can see further and further and the flying becomes more effortless and you can see the tree you launched out of and all the other trees around there. And you can see the trails of animals on the ground. And you can notice different animals. And you gain a whole new perspective from up here. And you continue to circle round and glide and realise how easy and effortless it is to fly as an owl. To feel the movement of the feathers with the wind and occasionally flapping those wings, needing very little effort to keep yourself in the air. And way off in the distance, you see some mountains. And over in the mountains, you notice a flickering, just a faint flickering of light. And as you look closely, you notice that there's somebody there, that there's a small cave and somebody is just in that cave, sitting by a fire. And as an owl who's interested in learning, interested in gaining new perspectives, while you continue circling and flying effortlessly, You project your thoughts into the mind of that person. You project and wonder what it would be like to be them. And you have a sense of being that person. Suddenly starting to hear the crackling fire. The slight echoing of the wind as it blows in and out of the cave. The warmth of the fire on your face. And you start to see the perspective from here. Looking out over woodland and valley. Seeing the perspective from this person's point of view. Looking out and seeing birds flying in the sky. An owl off in the distance. just relaxing by this fire, before having a sense of falling asleep, 
by this fire, drifting and relaxing. And while drifting and relaxing by this fire, you start to wonder what it's like to be a person. A person who has climbed this high up, who is relaxing by a fire, listening to nature and finding nature relaxing. And after they've slept for a while and the sun has set and the moon has risen in the sky and the stars have passed across the sky and the sun has risen in the morning. Having a sense of this person climbing down the mountain. And then when they've climbed down the mountain, they go exploring. And while they go exploring, they look inside themselves to look at what abilities they have that perhaps get overlooked. And they feel the magnetic lines around them. They just start to have this instinctive idea of different directions. And they relax and close their eyes. And they feel for the magnetic lines. And they feel what direction they feel is north. And what direction is south. And then they open their eyes and look at a compass and see whether they were correct or not. And then they close their eyes and attune more carefully and more finely to their own body their own inner self. And they do the same again. They have an idea of what is north and south. They align themselves with that and then they open their eyes and check with a compass. Until eventually they get very good at being able to just instinctively know north and south instinctively seem to be able to sense the magnetic field, almost like a human compass. And they start exploring like this human compass, not just to know which way is north and south and east and west, but to be able to feel their way around, to feel subtle changes to magnetic lines, searching for just where they feel this sense of a place to stop and explore. And while they search, they begin to allow their inner self to begin to take over they begin to allow themselves to access these senses people have long forgotten they had. And they start to become very lucid. They start to almost see magnetic lines, a bit like the aurora in the sky, as they walk through the dense woodland. They see almost shimmering, glowing light, and they follow that light, and they notice from time to time there are certain twists in the light, and they stop and explore these locations where there are twists in that light. 
where they know there's slight twists in the magnetic field line. And they continue to explore. And after much exploring, going deeper and deeper, they end up discovering that there's this twist and fold of magnetic field lines that seems quite pronounced. And they stop at that twist, stop at the folds. They start exploring and they find an entrance in the ground. And they head down into that entrance. And they follow an underground tunnel. And the tunnel is large enough to walk through. And it's man-made. And they follow that tunnel as it gradually slopes down deeper and deeper. And they continue to follow that tunnel deeper and deeper, further down. And after some time of walking, they find that the tunnel opens up into a vast chamber. And around the chamber, a light to be lit by a flame. And they walk around the chamber, they light those lights. And the whole chamber lights up. And they can tell that no one has been in this chamber for probably hundreds if not thousands of years. And they see an inscription on the wall over at the far side of the chamber. And they translate that inscription. And they read that inscription as being those who are helpful, find happiness. Those who seek happiness don't. And they don't know what this means. And they analyse the markings around the walls. And they see what looks like a slightly raised stone on the floor. And they push on that stone. And one of the walls slides open. And the other side of the wall is a gold ring. And they take the gold ring and they try the gold ring on different fingers and they find that on one of their fingers that ring fits. And as they slide that ring onto their finger, suddenly it's as if there's an overlaid reality on their real reality. As the real reality seems to fade into the background a bit. And a new reality, almost like augmented reality, suddenly overlays everything. And as they look up and around, they can see star maps lines going from one star to another. They can see what looks like plans for making different items and different objects. They can see what looks like historical records. Almost like an advanced civilization had been here and had somehow encoded all this information into the ring. And they found this information overwhelming. They found there was too much information coming in all at once. So they removed the ring and everything vanished. 
after a brief break of relaxing, they decided to try the ring on again. They placed the ring on again. And all that overwhelming information came flooding back. And they tried to record what they could. But decided that they would take the ring with them. And so they left that room, went through the chamber, and started finding their way back out. And then once out, they used their ability to detect magnetic field lines to navigate their way back the way they came. And the only way to go where they came was to go back to that cave, spend another night at that cave, before continuing their journey home with the knowledge they discovered. And so they went back to the cave, lit the fire, settled down next to that fire, listening to the crackling fire, watching the way the light dance and flicker on the walls of the cave, enjoying the setting sun, the changes to the sounds of nature as the sun sets, feeling a slight cool breeze on their face, relaxing back by that fire, and drifting comfortably asleep. And as they did, so the owl came too, wondering what had just happened. Everything seemed the same. They could see that person in that cave. It felt like no time at all had passed. They were still just circling, flying, relaxing, as if no time at all had passed, and yet somehow their consciousness had gone to the consciousness of that person, had gone through a whole journey as that person. And the owl wondered, maybe that was foresight, maybe they'd seen what's yet to come for that person, because it definitely didn't feel like any time had passed. And they continued circling before deciding that it was time for them to also begin to settle down. And they flew back to the tree They walked along that branch to the trunk of the tree. And as they walked along that branch, they pondered and wondered and wondered, wondering about the experience they had had and the nature of the experience that they had had. And they went back to where they came from and settled down for the night. As the person, the you on that desert island, was just continuing to drift and dream and float asleep to the sounds around you the lapping of the water on the shore, perhaps a breeze on the face, drifting deeper and more relaxed to sleep, finding the whole experience so peaceful, so calming, aware that 
You're going to drift and dream and have many more dreams. Bringing pleasure, relaxation, comfort and sleep all through the night. And they lay there dreaming. About how they'll find peace, comfort, tranquility and wonder within life. So as you listen to me telling this sleep story, you can allow yourself to get comfortable and you can begin to drift off asleep. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my words or the spaces between my words or perhaps just to my voice. As you drift asleep, I'm just going to tell a story in the background. A story about two friends. They've both decided to go out on a camping trip. They've gone down to their favourite beach. And they've spent the afternoon setting up camp. They've set up a tent that they'll both stay the night in. They've made themselves a campfire. And now, just as the sun is beginning to set, so they light the campfire. Position themselves just around that campfire. And they start to play a game of chess. They're just having a relaxing, mindless time, letting their minds wander while just playing a game of chess. Just using that to occupy their mind. And they're just focusing on being in the moment as the sun's setting in the background behind them. As the sound of the sea sloshes on the shore. As the sky changes colour from blues to reds. And the sounds of birds begin to quieten down for the evening. And they just enjoy sitting by this campfire playing chess. And these two friends just feel so calm and relaxed in this environment. They can hear the crackling of the fire. And they decide to just put some food on the fire that they can eat towards the end of their game of chess. And while they continue playing chess, focused on that game, so they can smell the food cooking and relax. And every now and then, there'll be just a bit more of a breeze and they'll hear the tent rustling slightly in that breeze. And then after a while, the sun's setting so far that it gets harder to see the game of chess they're playing. And so they decide to stop playing chess. They eat their food. And they decide just to go and wade in the water a little bit. 
The sea is so calm and still. Just the most relaxing sloshing as it reaches the shore. So they walk down the sandy beach. And they walk up to their knees in the water just to feel the warm water. Feel the way the water's warmer than the air. Just a warm, relaxing water. Feeling the way the sand moves over their feet and through their toes as the water moves in and out, moving forward up the beach and then pulling back, pulling some sand over and through their toes, relaxing, so calming. And they just talk as they gaze up at the night sky. Now the sun is almost completely set. There's just the faintest hint of red. And they can see the stars. And they just feel in awe looking up at the stars. And then they walk back to the tent. They go and sit in the tent. They slide into their respective sleeping bags. They notice the smell of relaxing in that tent. The way the sounds sound from within the tent. The sound of the tent moving slightly in the breeze. the way they can just feel so calm and relaxed in here. And then they lie down and they just talk to each other for a little while as the fire crackles away outside the tent, burning down to embers, giving the most comforting glow and flickering light. And then they both drift off asleep for the night. And as they drift off asleep, so one of them begins to dream that they've woken up and they dream that they've left the tent and that everything seems similar but slightly different. That it's almost like a dreamy kind of version of reality. That they feel so calm and peaceful and they walk along the beach a little way. And as they walk, so the sun rises. And while the sun rises, they begin to see a hut a little way along the beach. And they walk all the way to that hut. They enter the hut. And they notice that around the walls of the hut are different paintings. And one of the paintings is of two people sat playing chess on a beach. And they walk over to that painting and they think it's interesting that they had been sat playing chess on the beach. And now, in this dream, there's a picture in a hut of two people sat on a beach playing chess. And they walk over to that picture and they feel compelled to touch the picture. And as they reach out to touch the picture, so the hand goes through the picture. And 
as soon as their hand starts going through the picture, there's a flash. And they find that they seem to be in this picture. And this is an unfamiliar beach, and they can see two people playing chess. They can hear sounds of seagulls. And families in the distance. And hear the sound of the sea sloshing on the shore. And they decide they want to go and explore. And they walk along the seafront. And they can see that off a little way in the distance is a river mouth. And that there's a bench near the river mouth. And so they walk all the way along the seashore, barefoot in the sand, aware of the feeling of the sand beneath their feet and between their toes. And they arrive at the bench, sit down on the bench near the river mouth. And they're curious about this dream and they watch as the water flows out of the river into the sea. And that at the point where the water is flowing out into the sea, there's an area of rough water where the sea water is trying to flow into the river. And they find this curious, and they notice that birds seem to like this area, and keep diving into the water at this area. And they look down the river to see what they can see. And they can notice that the river has people along the sides of it for a little way. And then people just thin out. And the river starts flowing into countryside and woodland. And they can see that it seems to go all the way down to some hills. And it might even go as far as the mountains. And this is somewhere they've never been before. It just seems to be a dreamland. And they're curious at being lucid in this dream. And being aware of this dream. And aware of some of the similarities with their wakefulness. And their experiences. And while they relax on that bench, they just close their eyes a moment so they can better feel the warmth of the sun and feel any breeze of the air. And they take some time to go quiet in their mind and do that. And after a period of time, quiet in their mind, they notice that they can relax their breathing, slowing their breathing down, they notice that they can begin to feel calmer, more relaxed throughout their body and mind, And they decide to wander along that river a little bit. Given that this is a dream, they know they've got as long as they like to do this. So they start to wander along the river. And they walk past families, children playing. Friends and couples sitting on benches. And sitting on the ground, they continue walking past people with their feet in the water and carry on as fewer people are around them as they go into the countryside and carry on into woodland, still following this river.
and then after a while of following this river, they see a cat. And as they see the cat, so the cat seems to notice them. And it starts almost skipping to them and purring and meowing. And it starts weaving its way around and between their legs. And they can feel the fur on their feet and ankles as that cat weaves its way between their legs. And after it's weaved between their legs for a little while, it gets in front of them and then seems to just lose the ability of its own legs. It just slumps to the floor with its belly pointing slightly upwards. And so the person instinctively leans over and starts tickling and stroking the cat's belly. And the cat starts purring more and more. And then occasionally attacks the person's hand in a playful way and then purrs some more. And the cat lets them stroke it for a while before they continue their journey. And after a bit further, they find someone offering grapes. And they think this is an unusual thing to find someone offering grapes. And this person offers them some grapes and they wonder why they would want the grapes. And they say it's always good to have little packets of energy to not overdo it, but to have just enough energy to have just enough energy to keep you going from moment to moment. But this person says, I'll give you some grapes if you'll help me to solve a dilemma. I need to get to the other side of the river. But I can't seem to do it. There isn't any way across, and there's no bridges for miles. And the river wasn't particularly wide, but it was too wide to jump across. And so they wondered how they could help. And they loved the opportunity to invent things. So they sat down on the ground with the cat. And while they stroked the cat, they started thinking and wondering about how they can help this person cross the river. And they didn't have much to do this with. But after some thinking, they'd figured out a way of being able to go and get some wood from the woodland. And some of the vines, and use the vines and the wood to start to make a suspension bridge. To start to make it so it crosses part way so that they can get halfway over, jump the rest of the distance, build the other side up, and connect it so that this other person can get across the river. And the person was tremendously grateful. And they got across the river and gave them the grapes. And as they continued walking further along the river, they had this feeling like it would be nice to get to the mountains, but they knew that was a long way off. 
And then as they were walking, they heard a rumble. They heard a rumble of thunder in the distance. And the cat jumped up into their arms. And they couldn't notice any rain, but they knew that a storm must be coming. And so they wondered what the best course of action would be. Could they get all the way back to where they came from before the storm hit? Or would it be better to hunker down and weather the storm out? And they noticed that there was a fallen down tree quite near to the river but just slightly up a bank. And that fallen down tree, the area it had fallen out from, had left quite a big hole. So they decided to get loads of wood from around the area to stack it across the hole and then get loads of leaves quite broad leaves that were near the river pick those and weave those in with the wood and use the vines to help to weave it all together more and then cover it with a bit more wood and to build a shelter. And as the rain wasn't yet here, it was quite easy to gather everything they needed to build this shelter. So they built the shelter while it was dry. And they noticed the sound of those first drops of rain. And so they went into the shelter with the cat. Sat on some seats they'd built, digging into the mud. And they could hear the rain dropping down onto the shelter. Hear that pitter-patter of rain. And the cat just sat on their lap as they stroked the cat. And they just relaxed, noticing how with every drop of rain, it helped them to feel more relaxed. So they just relaxed to the sound of the rain. Occasionally, some water would get inside the camp inside their little setup, and that didn't matter. They remained dry and enjoyed the camp they'd made. And they could feel some breeze from time to time blowing into the camp. And then after a while, the rain passed and they left that camp and they could smell that fresh air they could smell that smell after a storm has passed by like the air has been cleaned and purified and they started their journey back along the edge of the river and the cat came with them a little way before stopping and almost saying goodbye and they continued their journey on their own all the way along that river back to the river mouth many many hours had passed now or so it seemed and they walked all the way back to the river mouth 
and started walking their way back along the seafront. And they didn't know how they were going to get back into that hut. Because at this side, there was no picture. But they knew that somehow something would happen. So they went back. They could see where those people were playing chess. And those people weren't playing chess now. And they went and sat near that area, just watching the sea, listening to the birds. They could see the storm off in the distance over the sea, as it moved further and further away. And then after a while, they began to feel sleepy. Their eyes began to close. They began to drift comfortably asleep. And as they did, they found themselves stood in front of a picture with their fingertip touching the picture in that cabin. And they walked out of that cabin all the way back to their tent through this surreal feeling world and arrived back at their tent, lay back down in their tent and felt that there was something they're learning from this experience, something therapeutic and helpful to them as they close their eyes and drift comfortably and relaxed and deeply asleep for the night. So as you listen to me tell this story, you can begin to drift comfortably asleep. And I don't know whether you'll drift comfortably asleep faster to the sound of my words or to the spaces between my words. And as you drift comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell this story in the background. A story about a person who has taken some time to find themselves. They decided they needed some time alone, some time to recharge their batteries, to have time for themselves, a little bit of solitude for a while, a time of peace and inner discovery. And so to get that space that they desired, they went to a log cabin on the edge of a lake, surrounded by woodland and mountains. And they were sat in a chair in front of a crackling fire, relaxing, drifting into a reverie, enjoying this space, enjoying being at one with the world around them, being in the moment, being present, hearing the crackling fire, hearing the slight whistling of the wind outside, and with their eyes closed, being able to hear some distant sounds of birds. And the sensation of their breathing as they breathed in and out. And the weight of their arms resting there. As they relaxed and experienced 
being present and in the moment. And most of their day was spent just being present, sitting still. But occasionally they went out to have a walk. To be present walking, to do mindful walking. And they walked out of the cabin, descended the steps from the cabin to the path below, being present and counting each step as they went. On step ten, nine, eight, seven. Six, five, four, three, two, one, stepping on the soil below, noticing the change in the sound of the footsteps from the steps to the soil, following that soil path around into the woodland and beginning to walk into that woodland. And as they walked into the woodland, so they were present. They felt the breeze of the air on their skin, the temperature of the environment, the feeling of each footstep. The sound of rustling leaves as the breeze blew through the trees. The way shards of light would sparkle and dance. As the sun broke through the trees. Enjoying the misty shards. As they walked deeper into the woodland, smelling the smell of pine trees, walking deeper and deeper into the woodland, and then arriving at a tree and climbing that tree to a makeshift tree house they've been building out here during their stay and resting in that tree house and noticing the slight sway of the tree as they rest up there high enough up to look over most of the woodland And to be able to see birds flying overhead. And using their binoculars. They watch as bird of prey fly overhead. Circle around. And occasionally dive down towards the ground before appearing again high up in the air, so gracefully circling, seemingly so relaxed. And they take in the moment, enjoying being in the moment, watching those birds as they circle overhead. And then gazing off through the binoculars, through the trees. Seeing on the edge of the trees and the meadow in the distance. Deer feeding and weaving between the tree line and walking out into the meadow. Before moving back into the safety of the tree line. 
just watching them grazing and watching how they interact and knowing that they're learning from the experience they're learning from being present from being able to be outside of their mind being present in the here and now and what's going on around them taking pleasure in simple tasks in simple observations developing that sense of curiosity and then as the day moves on so they descend that tree they walk back through the woodland, back out in front of that log cabin, and then they turn the other way and they walk down to the lake, they walk along a slight jetty, climb into a rowing boat, unhook the rope from the shore, and begin to row out into the middle of the lake. Being present, hearing the sounds of the oars pushing against the water as they move towards the middle of the lake, as the boat rocks ever so slightly in the water, as the long and shallow waves pass by rowing out towards the middle of the lake and as they reach the middle of the lake so they pull the oars into the boat getting out a fishing rod and then they cast the line out into the water and rest back and wait and they just enjoy being present they just enjoy being in this moment aware that they're waiting for their dinner and that how long they have to wait is out of their control And so they just wait and lie back and they can see the blue sky, see the way clouds are passing across the sky, feel that slight rocking of the boat, the slight sloshing sound as the water sloshes against the edge of the boat relaxing in the moment and as they relax in the moment it's almost as if time stands still and then after a little while they hear a plopping sound they notice that something's pulling on the line and so they get up and they focus on feeling the experience of catching that fish and they catch themselves the fish before rowing back to shore And that evening, cooking themselves the fish for dinner, before settling down, drifting off asleep, 
knowing this is the last night here, but it's not the end of their experience, because their journey is part of their experience, and they still need to journey home. And the next morning, they awaken, they leave the cabin, they begin their long, long journey home. And they drive initially down a long straight road with woodland on either side of that road. And then they turn onto another road with woodland on one side and vast open space on the other side. And then after a long drive they turn onto another road that seems to be a better quality road as they approach civilization. And they arrive at a hotel to stop for the night. And they check in to the hotel. They go to their room. Settle down in bed. And they drift comfortably and relax to sleep. And as they drift comfortably and relaxed asleep, so they begin to notice a spiral in their mind's eye, almost drawing them into the center of that spiral. And they watch as that spiral spins in their mind's eye and notice in the center how a train begins to appear. And the train seems to be forming as if it's forming around them, from in front of them within the spiral, at the front of the train. And then carriages are forming in front of them, and then around them, and then off behind them. And as the carriages are forming around them, so they begin to hear the clippity clap of the train on a the track. They begin to feel the movement of sitting on a seat on a train. They begin to see movement out the window. A scenery outside the window flashes past them while the train speeds along. They begin to hear sounds of other passengers chatting with each other until eventually the whole experience is formed that they are sat here on a train Travelling through somewhere they don't know and don't recognise. And outside the window they can see grassland, they can see low hills. It looks like some towns and villages that they're passing by. And a river running almost along near the track. weaving and winding and people walking along the river bank some boats in the river thick fluffy clouds in the sky and they gaze out the window as that environment flashes by. And they look around themselves, they see the other passengers. 
and they're curious where they are in this dream and what this dream means. They continue their sense of curiosity. They continue what they've been learning during their solitude in the log cabin to show curiosity, external focus on what's going on around them. And they see the different passengers and they decide to stand up and walk down the train. And they notice this is like a really old steam train. And they open one carriage, they step across to the other carriage, open the door to that carriage. And have that noisy moment when they're outside stepping between carriages. And they walk through the next carriage. And after a while, they notice this steam train is slowing down. And then the steam train appears to pull into a station. And as that steam train pulls into the station, so they hear someone saying, all change please, all change. And all the passengers are getting up, getting their luggage, and leaving the train. And they leave the train themselves as well. And they look around the platform. They leave the platform, leave the station. And find themselves walking down a country road away from that station. And they don't know where they're going. They just know that they're here to learn. And they walk down that country road. Towards a small stone building. And they arrive at that stone building. They knock on a wooden door to the building. And a man answers the door with a friendly smile. As if he was expecting them. And he welcomes them in. And they walk in and he gestures for them to take a seat. And he brings over a cup of tea. He gives them that cup of tea and they feel the warmth of that in their hands. And they have some sips of that tea, feeling the warmth with each sip. Noticing how refreshing that is. And then the person tells them they're going to have an experience to build on the experiences and the knowledge they've already gained. And that this will cement those experiences in place. And this man tells them to close their eyes. Take a deep breath and begin to relax. And as you begin to relax. You can notice a healing light. Beginning to enter the top of your head. And you can notice what colour that healing light is as it enters the top of your head. And maybe you'll notice the temperature with that healing light and the way that healing light moves down the top of your head, down your face, your ears, your forehead, your cheeks, perhaps warming your cheeks a little, maybe a different temperature, maybe your forehead 
as that healing light continues down your face, your neck, down to your shoulders, almost like that healing light is giving you the most comfortable healing massage on those shoulders, relaxing any tension, relaxing, passing that healing light deep within you as it passes down those shoulders, down both arms, relaxing the muscles, healing as it goes down, healing muscles, healing bone, healing every cell in your body as it passes down, relieving tension and dis-ease as it moves down to the forearms, down into the wrists, healing as it goes down to the fingertips, healing all the way down to the fingertips. And perhaps you'll notice as it's healing all the way down to the fingertips, maybe the energy that goes with that light, maybe a heaviness or a lightness or a tingling, or some other sensation of the energy as it heals all the way down to your fingertips. And then passes down from your shoulders, down your upper back, all the way down around your chest, around your sides, all the way down to your stomach, to your lower back, down deep within you, down deep within you, all the way down through your body, healing deeper and deeper, as that healing light passes all the way down to your waist, all the way down to the buttocks and around your groin area and then down through your legs, all the way down the upper legs, the lower part of your legs, healing all the way down to your feet. And then just noticing that healing light encircling you, passing through you, being a part of you. And a part of your breath as you breathe in healing light and breathe out any stress or tension. And this person guided them through this experience before giving them a moment to absorb all that as a being. And after they absorbed all that as a being, they now understood what they needed to understand from their whole experience since the log cabin. And once they understood all that, so they drifted from this experience even deeper and deeper into a deep and comfortable, relaxing sleep, drifting deeply and comfortably asleep. So as you rest there and begin to slowly drift off asleep, you can listen along to me talking in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sounds of my words or whether you'll drift comfortably asleep to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to drift comfortably asleep. So I'm just going to tell you a story. A story about a woman sitting down under a tree 
in her English country garden. And she's sitting down under the tree, beginning to meditate and drift inside her mind. And in front of her she focuses on a rose, on a rose that's just beginning to form. And she allows her attention to settle on that rose, to settle just on the bud of that rose. And she relaxes there under the tree, legs crossed, breathing in and breathing out. Deeply breathing in and breathing out, breathing all the way from her stomach, breathing in comfort and relaxation, breathing that all the way in through her throat, into her chest, all the way deep down into her stomach, and breathing out any stress or tension as her attention focuses more on that rose, breathing in and breathing out. And while she focuses on that rose, breathing in and breathing out in that relaxing way, so her attention narrows. And she's aware of the sounds of country birds in the background. She's aware of the colour of the sky, the look of the clouds as they pass overhead, the sun, the movement of grass, of leaves, of plants, the rustling of the leaves of the tree above her head, the way the rustling moving leaves and branches make shards of light dance all around her as the sun shines through those leaves. Aware of the smells in the garden, the sight of insects, of bees flying into flowers, all following their routines as she gazes at that rose and just allows her attention to settle on that rose and everything else begins to fade into the background a little bit like she's getting tunnel vision like all of her attention is on that rose and as all of her attention falls onto that rose, so time begins to change. It's as if time for her stands still, while time around her ticks by, and everything around her appears like it's speeding up like she is the anchor point, like she is the stationary, timeless part of the experience, observing time passing around her. She sees the stalk of the rose slowly extending. She sees that bud of the rose gradually growing getting larger and larger. She sees night become day and day become night. The sun pass across the sky, the stars and the moon pass across the sky. And as she watches that rose, she notices the petals growing larger and larger before they begin to open up beautifully, symmetrically. 
and in her mind she has a sense of what it would be like to touch a petal gently between her thumb and forefinger, that smooth and waxy feel of a rose petal. She allows her attention to fall so much on the rose she focuses just on the smell given off by that single rose. As the particles from that rose reach her nose. And she allows that to absorb her attention even deeper into this meditative state. And as she continues to drift and dream and meditate in this way and watch the world go by out of her peripheral vision while she just connects with that rose. So she begins to drift inside her mind. She begins to see some unusual writing scrolling down her vision. Like in her mind's eye, she's starting to see writing. And it's writing that looks like it's in some ancient language, just scrolling past her vision and surrounding her, almost like it's overlaying the reality that she's in as she drifts even deeper into this meditation. And while she drifts even deeper into this meditation, so the writing becomes clearer. And she has an intuitive sense of understanding that writing. Even though she consciously feels like she's never seen it before. And her focus leaves the rose and begins to transfer to the writing. As the garden begins to fade away. And she begins to just see the writing falling down around her. Scrolling down around her. And she watches as that writing scrolls. And she feels a sense of peace, of calm, of connection to inner wisdom, to something greater than herself. Like somehow this writing is a sign of a connection to some universal wisdom, perhaps a universal library. And she watches as that writing continues to fall around her. And then after a while, the last of the writing falls down past her. And it's almost like when a curtain drops to the ground. That as the last of the writing passes her eyes. She's gazing out over an environment she's never seen before. She's gazing out over a desert. She can see pyramids in the distance. A striking blue sky and golden sand. Feeling the warmth of the sun. And as she looks around, she sees behind her a Volkswagen camper van. And she goes to that van. Slides open the side door and climbs in. And that van has a certain smell to it. A certain authenticity. A certain feel. And she climbs through to the front seat, places her hands on the steering wheel, and is aware of the size of this steering wheel, and how much larger it is to other steering wheels, 
of other vehicles that she's been in. And she pulls the handle out and pushes it back in and starts the van. And can feel the van vibrating as the engine starts. Can smell the smell of the fumes from the engine starting. And she starts driving across the desert, following a dusty road. that's barely a road at all. And she follows that, heading toward the pyramids. And she's unsure where she is, what she's searching for. All she knows is that she's trusting herself to find her way. Through this uncertainty, through this experience, She's aware that in reality, she's probably still sat under that tree, gazing at that rose. But that her mind has wandered, and drifted and dreamed inside, deeper and deeper, to some place so deep, it makes this feel real to her. giving her some insight, some experience. And she can feel the breeze coming in the windows as she drives that VW van towards those pyramids. And she's surprised as she gets closer and closer to those pyramids how large they really are. And as she arrives at the foot of the pyramids, they're pyramids unlike any she's seen before. They look like typical pyramids, but there's something different about them, about their shape, their size. And the entrance into the one she's in front of, And she takes a torch and she enters that pyramid and begins to explore. And as she walks to the pyramid and into the pyramid, so her footsteps change from the sound of soft sand beneath her feet to the sound of echoing stone as the light reflects around the walls of the chamber, around the walls of the corridor that she's entering. As she walks deeper and deeper into the pyramid, and she notices how the temperature changes, how inside the pyramid is cooler than it was outside the pyramid. And she continues to walk deeper and deeper into the chamber. And the deeper she walks, the more it seems to open up to the point where her torch can't see across to the other side or to either side or above her. And she's aware of the size of the chamber. By the way the echo reflects off the walls. And seems to have a slight delay back to her ears. With each step she takes. And when she eventually reaches the far side of this chamber. So she finds a solid stone wall 
and she runs her hand along the wall and walks from one side to the other. And as she walks, so she discovers one area where there's a slight change in stone. And she decided there's probably a hidden door here. And she searches for a way to open the door. She feels around the walls. She shines the torch on the floor. She shines the torch around the walls. Until eventually she notices another stone that's ever so slightly outset from all the stones in the wall. And she walks to that stone. Pushes on that stone. Pushing the stone in line with the others. And the rumbling sound of stone reveals a door opening up. She walks through that door, down a staircase, and finds herself faced with a view she never thought she would see in the middle of a desert. A vast forest, the sound of running water, of a waterfall, of a fast flowing stream or river, and the sight of a distant lake. And down here, under this pyramid, somehow suddenly she's faced with a world that's lit up as if it's daylight. And she walks down into that forest, from stone to earth, noticing the smells of the forest, the sounds of the forest. Walking through that forest, and she finds her way to the river, walks along that river, following it down towards the lake. And while she walks along towards the lake, she can smell the smell of the water. She can notice what look like fish swimming in the water. She can hear sounds of birds. Everything sounds familiar, but not like anything she's heard before. And she follows that river all the way to the lake. And as she's approaching the lake, so she sees in the distance the shadow of somebody sat on a post with their back to her, gazing out over that lake. And she's unsure who it could be, how long they've sat there, and how they could be there when she's only just arrived here. And she walks all the way to them. And as she approaches, she feels that they're a friendly presence. That they contain wisdom, knowledge. And she walks over to them. And they don't turn to look at her. They just carry on gazing the way they are. And she reaches them walks round in front of them, looks at them, and asks who they are, and where we are. And they say, you're not where you think you are. You're somewhere different. You're here, not there. 
and she's a little confused by this and wonders what it all means. And they say, you are here, not there. You're not where you think you are. You're here. And they hold out a hand, turning their palm up. They let their gaze drop to their hand. And she feels this urge to reach out, to place her hand in their hand. And very slowly she reaches out, and very slowly she rests her hand on their hand. And as she does, as soon as their hands connect, so their minds connect also. And it's like she's suddenly out in space, zooming out from that place, looking down on a world with earth-like features. And she continues zooming out further into space. And she can see a star like the sun of this world. She can see other planets as she zooms further back out into space. And at high speed she continues to zoom away from that planet. Seeing the star, the planets moving far enough away to see the neighbourhood of stars that that star's in, zooming even further away and seeing a cluster of stars and zooming further away and further away until the star she's zooming away from that she's still looking at still has all her focus on. It's just a pinprick in the sky surrounded by millions of other pinpricks of light in the sky. Until she begins to enter Earth's atmosphere and finds herself arriving on Earth at night time, gazing up into the night sky still gazing at that star and recognizing it as one of the stars in the Seven Sisters. And recognizing that she's landed at night time at the foot of the pyramid that she entered And recognizing that all these other pyramids in this little area probably resembled that constellation in the sky. And just as she had that realization, so she felt herself drawn back through space and time, back towards that place, back towards that planet, back to that forest, back to that person, and suddenly with a slight in-breath, she was aware of that person again as she raised her hand off of their hand and aware she was back where she was and realised she's here, not there and understood what they meant and realised that somehow the ancients had created this portal this portal that was there 
that can transport people here to where this timeless being is who offers wisdom, insight and they talk for a while as she gazes into his eyes and they talk for a while as she learns insights, wisdom, knowledge And they tell her that she can row out into the lake. And they tell her that there's a box to be found in the lake. A box that they've been guarding all this time. Just waiting for someone to discover this place. And as soon as she finds that box, they'll be free to leave here. And they've been waiting year after year. This timeless being watching over this box, waiting for the moment when someone arrives to get this box. And she was told you can only find the box with relaxation and focus. She was told she needed to lie back in the water. She needed to listen. And notice the way the sound travels underwater to pinpoint the location of the box. That you need to have your ears underwater long enough to do that. And so you can't just dive in and keep diving down hunting. You need patience and relaxation. So she entered the water, lay on her back, rested her head back in that warm water, with her ears just underwater, noticing how the sounds changed from her ears outside the water to her ears underwater. And she could hear the sound of the waterfall up the river that subtle rumbling sound. She could hear the sounds of some bubbles, some sounds from within her ears. She could hear some sounds of some of the creatures in the lake. She could hear her heart gently beating rhythmically as she rest there and while she rested there so she began to listen to her heartbeat listen to the way her heartbeat travelled from her body and bounced around the lake the really subtle reflection of the sound of her heartbeat underwater as she floated across the lake and almost like using her heartbeat and her ears as a sonar machine she lay very still just floating gently across the lake with her heartbeat relaxed, strong and rhythmically beating using her meditative abilities to focus on such a subtle sound 
to begin to notice the difference in the way the sound arrives at the left and the right ears. Just resting motionless and floating. Letting the water move her rather than her moving through the water. As she noticed a subtle anomaly in the reflection of the sound to her ears. And knew she floated above the box. And she turned herself over, put her head under the water and looked down towards the bottom. And she couldn't quite see whether the box was down there. She knew that she'd have to hold her breath a while and relax for this dive. And so she took a few deep breaths, then held her breath and relaxed deeply as she dived down and time appeared to be going so slow as she dived down deeper and deeper, all the way to the bottom, as a box began to come into view, and she could hear bubbles at her ears, she could feel the water around her, hear sounds underwater, notice the way light weaves and waves and moves, as she reached the box, opened the box, and found what looked like a large gold coin in the box. And she took the coin, swam back to the surface, felt that water run from her face as she broke through the surface, swam back to the shore, and could see that wise being smiling at her, and telling her she'd found what she was looking for, even though she didn't know that's what she was looking for. And that it isn't about that gold coin. It's about the discovery of the gold coin, about how she discovered it. And the gold coin is a representation that will remind her of that. And as they said that, they began to turn almost like to smoke or fog, just fading away to nothing. As she then found her way back out of this forest, all the way back, to that pyramid and through the pyramid and in her own time found her way back to the camper van and drove back in the camper van to where she'd found that van and then exited the van taking the coin with her and sat down and began meditating looking over towards those pyramids. And every time her eyes blinked so, she saw glimpses of the country garden. And after a while she found herself just in the country garden, gazing at that rose, that fully formed rose as it's visited by a bee, which then flies away. And she looks down into her lap and sees that coin resting in her upturned hands. And she holds the coin, stands up, 
she's aware she's learned a deep lesson. And just as she does so, the sun has long set, and she goes inside, and that night settles down, and drifts comfortably, relaxed, asleep. As you take a moment to allow yourself to get comfortable and to let your eyes gently close, I'm just going to tell a story in the background. So with your eyes closed, you can imagine drifting into this experience. Imagining a woman walking along one rainy night She's got an umbrella held above her head. She's walking down a street. She can hear the way the rain hits the umbrella. She can hear the sound of that rain. She can feel the slight spray of water that finds its way to her face. She can hear the sound of each footstep and other sounds occasionally of other people hurrying out of the rain. And yet she just continues to walk purposefully along the path. And she can hear cars passing by and see them pass by in the sound of the rain and the sound that cars make driving along a wet road. And after a while of walking, she turns off the road, turns off this path and heads into a wooded area and she notices how in this wooded area, far less rain is reaching her umbrella. She can hear that rain hitting the leaves above her and larger drops dropping from the leaves to the ground and the sound of those raindrops sploshing on the ground. and the slight rustling sound of the leaves in the breeze and moving with the rain. As she continues to walk and notices the different sound of each footstep here compared to out on the path by the road. And the further away from the road she walks, the quieter it gets. And the deeper into the woods she goes. And she finds her way all the way through the woods until she comes to a clearing. And she can notice the muted green colour of the grass. as the rain gives a slight grey-blue tinge to everything. She walks across that grass. All the way to the edge and over on that far edge. Is a bank that leads down to a beach. And she stands on that edge, gazing off down that bank, down to the beach, noticing the way the water is rolling in onto the shore, noticing how with this rain, the water seems a little rougher than usual. and a little bit more churned up. 
and perhaps has a little bit more of a greeny colour in the water. And she watches as those waves roll in onto the shore, and the white water rolling and sloshing along the shore. And the sound of it pulling back again to the sea. And in this clearing she looks around and she can't see far out to sea because of the rain. But she can notice some areas of light, some rays of sun striking the ocean in various points off in the distance. And she knows the rain will begin to clear a bit soon. And she wanders along this clearing. She wanders along the grass. Gazing down towards the sea. And she's out here on holiday. It's supposed to be a summer holiday. And yet, here she is in the rain. But she doesn't let that deter her. She's still enjoying being out in nature. Still enjoying. Gazing out over the ocean. hearing the sound of the rain on the umbrella. And after a while she finds some steps down to the seafront. And she follows those steps down and walks through some stones, noticing the sound of the footsteps changing from steps to stones. The feeling of the ground beneath the feet changing from steps to stones and then down onto damp sand, with the feet sinking slightly with each footstep, and being able to look down at the feet and notice the way. The sand dries a little with each footstep, and the water moves away from the feet. And she walks along the seafront, aware of the sea, on the shore, being louder now than it was before. And she notices the way that the sea breaks on different rocks that are dotted through the sea, unsure whether these rocks were placed there to break the water intentionally or have always just naturally been there. She can feel that watery air on her skin, on her cheeks, smelling the slight salty smell of the spray from the sea as she explores along the shore. And while she walks along the shore, so she's gazing at the ground, aware that sometimes fossils are found along this area. And as she gazes around, she discovers what looks like a shell embedded in a rock. And it's just the shadow of the shell that was once there. It's just a fossil of the shell. She picks it up and looks at it and runs her finger over that, feeling the bumps, the smoothness, the weight of that in her hands. And she unzips a pocket on her coat and places it in the pocket and zips the pocket back up again. 
before continuing along the seafront. And she thinks she sees someone sitting on one of the rocks a little further away. And she tries to squint a little through the rainy sky. And she's sure that there's someone there. And she walks closer and closer, wondering who they are, what they're doing, why they're out here. They clearly don't have an umbrella. And as she gets closer, she's surprised by what her eyes see. And she can't believe her eyes. And she thinks maybe some salt water has got in her eyes, so she dries one of her hands and wipes her eyes. And all that's done is made it clearer that what she's seeing is true. It looks like what she would describe as a mermaid just resting on a rock. She walks closer and closer and she's surprised to notice that mermaid smile at her as she gets close to it. And while she's close to the mermaid and the mermaid smiles, she thinks to herself that clearly this mermaid is friendly. She walks over and has no idea whether she'll be able to communicate with them or not. And is shocked when she introduces herself and the mermaid responds and seems to be able to talk the same language perfectly fine. And she asks why this is, and the mermaid explains that she swims in these waters, and so she hears the sounds of people talking here. She hears the sounds of people on the shore. And so, just over years and years, she's picked up the language. But she also has another land that she comes from. And sometimes when the weather's like this, she likes to come up to the surface. She knows there's normally no one around on the surface and get to see what life is like out here, outside of the ocean. She explains how the sounds, time, everything is so different underwater. And the reason this woman enjoys going to the beach on holiday is because of her love of water, her love of the beach. She loves being in water and by water and the smell of water. And the mermaid explains that she too enjoys the beach, not just being underwater, but the sights, the sounds, the textures. That things have a totally different texture, totally different feeling when they're out of the water. That sound is totally different. And so it's like being a whole new other world. And after a while of talking, while the woman holds the umbrella over her head, she notices that the rain begins to subside. The sun begins to creep out from behind the clouds. So she puts down her umbrella. carries on talking to this mermaid. 
She wants to know everything. Where is she from? How can she be real? Why, if it was this easy for her to stumble across the mermaid, has no one else ever done it? Why didn't she just swim off when she saw someone approaching? And the mermaid explained that she'd considered swimming off, but she was curious about this person who would be out in this weather. And she thought about how it might look if she dived into the water. She explained that she thought this woman looked kind and compassionate, looked so caring that there was a risk that if she had seen her dive into the water she might have assumed that someone had fallen off the rock and had got into trouble in the water and might try and dive in after her and could get themselves into trouble in the water when really there's no one that needs saving. And the woman and the mermaid continue to converse as the sun continues to come out. And the mermaid said she was worried that soon others may start to come to the beach to walk dogs, to take advantage of this dry spell. And she didn't really want to be seen. And as she was talking, something strange happened. The woman noticed that her tail turned into two legs. That as the sun dried her out, so she transformed and looked just like a human. And the woman asked about this, fascinated, asking, have you ever thought of just leading a life, going exploring when you've got two legs? And the mermaid said that the trouble is she can't control it. When she dries out, she has two legs. But as soon as she gets wet, Her body automatically has a response that turns her legs into a tail. And that she couldn't risk this happening while wandering down a street. And she said that it's possible to become a mermaid and she said that if the woman's interested she can visit where the mermaid has come from she explained that we all have an evolutionary past and part of that past is aquatic And that mermaids and mermen have the power to trigger certain epigenetic changes within people through the power of touch. That can bring back some of those aquatic properties. And the woman was curious about this. She thought it would be wonderful to visit where this mermaid came from. But she also wanted to know, how is it that the mermaid's body knows whether it's raining or not, or whether it's wet or not? Wondering if the mermaid was wearing trousers, 
and waterproof shoes and didn't get their legs wet, would they turn back into a tail or not? Would they turn into a tail if they got their hands wet? And the mermaid said she'd never been far enough to find out. She'd never worn clothes. She didn't know what it was like to wear clothes. That you don't wear clothes when you're underwater. So they just get tangled around you. And nobody makes clothes underwater. So she'd never had an opportunity to discover. And the woman and this mermaid found themselves so absorbed in conversation, found that somehow they seemed to just gel so well. Time seemed to just fly by as they became absorbed in the moment. as if they'd known each other for a lifetime. And the mermaid touched the woman, gently on the shoulders, running her fingertips very, very lightly, from her shoulders down her arms, down the outside of her arms, then very lightly down the inside of her arms to her elbows, the inside of her elbows and then very lightly under the jaw on either side around the neck and then very lightly down the back and the woman could feel tingling felt her mind wander and felt a bit of a shudder as changes began to happen inside her body and the mermaid looked her square in the eyes and said, trust me. And the woman said, I do. And they leapt off the rock together, splashing into the water, followed by rays of light and bubbles rising to the surface as the sound changed as everything became more muted and quiet and tones seemed to stretch out and deepen and the woman held her breath initially And the mermaid held her hand and looked at her calmly in a kind and friendly way. And said again, trust me. And the woman relaxed. Her jaw relaxed. Her body was relaxed, floating in water. She just relaxed so deeply and instinctively seemed to breathe underwater as if it was a perfectly natural thing.
and then she noticed that the mermaid's tail had returned and she didn't know at what point. She wondered whether it was the second the mermaid splashed into the water. She didn't see it change from legs to a tail. And the mermaid held her hand as they swam deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper under the sea, seeing fish swimming around, passing floating seaweed, relaxing deeper and more comfortable under the sea. And as they went deeper, the woman noticed some glowing off in the distance and they swam down towards that glowing. And the mermaid said that ordinarily you can't see that glowing. That the only reason why she can see the glowing and see this reality down here is because they're together and because of the change to her senses, the change to her way of being that's allowed her to breathe underwater, it allows her senses to perceive what they once couldn't. And they swim down deeper all the way to those lights and find a whole town of mer people interacting with each other, getting on with each other. It looked surprisingly familiar and yet it was under the sea. And the mermaid said she wanted to take her to one of her favourite places down here. And she took the woman down a, what was like a quiet path that was away from the hustle and bustle of that mer town. And took her out to an area that seemed to plunge off deeply into darkness and sat down on the edge and the woman sat down on the edge with her gazing out across the deep open ocean and the woman could hear the sounds of whales see some humpback whales swimming could recognize their intelligence the intent in their behaviors and she watched as those humpback whales just passed by going about their daily life and huge shoals of fish swam around and there was so much life down here and some fish and some other animals down here seem to have bioluminescence as her eyes accustomed to the darkness, the dimness. As she gazed down, she could see glowing light shows playing out before her. 
of a rainbow of colours. And she sat here on this edge, up close with the mermaid. And she started having this feeling like somehow this was who she was meant to spend the rest of her life with. And she thought that seems like an unusual feeling. But she's felt such a connection to this person over such a short period of time. And she openly, just instinctively told the mermaid this. And the mermaid reciprocated that she too seems to have felt this incredible connection like somehow this was meant to be somehow they were meant to meet and somehow Fate had brought them together, and they could either go against fate and decide it's ridiculous to feel like you found your soulmate that quick and move on and miss the opportunity, or to explore it, to spend time together and to enjoy being in the moment, enjoying being with the person in that moment who it feels right to be with. And they both felt it felt right to be with each other, but they came from totally different worlds. They had no idea how or whether it was possible to make it work. The woman wanted to know how long she can manage to stay underwater for. How long will the changes to her body last? And the mermaid said that the changes can last as long as she wants. The changes only reverse when she takes a gasp of air. And then the air triggers changes to breathe again on land. And they didn't know how they could make it work. The woman had a life, a job. She went into work every day, did her job and then when she had an opportunity, she'd go on holiday for a little while to the beach and then go back and carry on working and after work be too tired to do anything. So she would just work and sleep and work and sleep, go for a break for a while on holiday and then work and sleep, work and sleep. And if she suddenly disappeared, people would be worried about her. And they didn't know how you could tell humans that there are mer people, that humans wouldn't believe it. And she couldn't just say, I'm going to move and live underwater. But it was early days of their relationship. They knew they would work all that out. They just knew they were each other's soulmate and had to be together. They decided that at some point in the future, the mermaid would come out on land And they would figure out 
the extent of her legs turning into a tail? What triggers that? Whether they can just make sure she's wearing waterproof trousers and shoes or whatever it is that's needed and if not, perhaps the woman can say that she's just moving abroad, moving away and she's going travelling and that she'll let people know from time to time and keep in contact with people saying where she is And then she could move and live with the mermaid, but she wondered what the mermaid eats. What the mermaid's life is like. And this was all stuff they had to explore. Coming from two totally different worlds and finding love. They just had to have the courage to explore love. To have love where you find it. And they both just sat there gazing out, arm in arm, resting on each other. Watching the underwater world go by. Confident that they were going to lead a long and happy life together, but unsure yet as to how. But being comfortable with the unknown, comfortable with the uncertainty, and excited by what they've got to discover in the future as together they drift and float into a reverie, dreaming about what the future might hold, and the wonders they might experience. So as you listen to this, you can begin to drift comfortably into a deep trance, and from that deep trance you can begin to drift asleep. So take a moment to allow yourself to get comfortable and allow your eyes to gently close. And with your eyes closed, just focus on the top of your head and just notice any sensations there and have a sense of the muscles around your eyes relaxing, a sense of the muscles around your head and neck relaxing, just having those muscles gently soften and relax and you can take a breath in and a breath out and with each out breath you can have a sense of deep profound relaxation passing in through your head in through your nose and mouth and passing down through your body as you can allow your awareness to move gently down to your neck And just notice the muscles around your neck. Allow them to comfort and soften and relax. Allowing the muscles around the front of your neck to relax the side and the back of your neck. Just deeply relaxing and relaxing the muscles of the jaw. That's it. And allowing that relaxation to continue down 
to your shoulders. And I don't know whether the relaxation will pass down both shoulders at the same time, or whether it'll pass down one shoulder faster than the other. And just allow that relaxation to spread down the shoulders. Allowing that relaxation to spread down both shoulders, around both shoulders, like someone giving you a comfortable massage. Gently rubbing those shoulders, releasing any tension in those shoulders. And with each out breath, that tension can release. And the shoulders can slump. And you can let those shoulders slump as you relax deeper and more comfortably. That's it. And you can continue that relaxation. And notice how the relaxation moves down your arm. I don't know whether it will move down the left arm or the right arm fastest. But just notice how that relaxation moves down the arms. Making the arms loose and limp and heavy. Making those arms feel so loose, so limp, so heavy. That the thought of moving them. just seems like it would be so much effort, like they weigh so much. Allowing that relaxation to go all the way down to the hands, to the fingertips. Almost like the relaxation is flooding so much through those hands, those fingertips, that it's working its way out the end of those fingertips, out the palm of the hand really adding weight, comfort, stillness, deep, profound relaxation to those arms, to those hands, to those fingers. Allowing your body to relax deeper and deeper and more profoundly. So deeply relaxed. It becomes almost so heavy it just doesn't want to move. As that relaxation begins to spread down the chest, down your torso, relaxing your upper back, your lower back, relaxing your chest and your stomach muscles and your sides. And just allow your breathing to deepen, breathing in, counting to seven, breathing out, counting to eleven, and for a little while, just continue breathing in, counting to seven, and breathing out, counting to eleven, just making each out breath longer than each in-breath, breathing in, counting to seven, breathing out, counting to eleven, slowly and rhythmically, allowing that breathing to deepen, breathing from your stomach, breathing in, relaxation, and comfort, healing, warmth, breathing out any discomfort, any stress, any pain, or anything else you'd like to rid from your body, breathing in comfort, relaxation, breathing out any discomfort and stress.
and allowing yourself to relax deeper, more profoundly. As you continue to listen to my voice in the background, and while you listen to my voice in the background and you count in to seven, out to eleven, the relaxation can move down your body, move down your legs, all the way down to your feet. And then as you continue to breathe in, counting to seven, and breathe out, counting to eleven, you can have a sense of a healing purple light that's shining on your face, on your head, and that's beginning to scan and pass through you healing and relaxing from your head down through your face, your neck, your shoulders, your arms, down your body, down your legs, all the way down to the tips of your toes. Just having that healing light passing through you, deepening, relaxing. Feeling the deepening, feeling the relaxation, perhaps noticing how relaxed your face is getting, perhaps noticing the relaxation in your cheeks, in your hands, Some people may feel like there's a certain kind of relaxed numbness setting in. Where you gradually stop being so aware of your body as you drift inside your mind. Ready to go even deeper into this deep trance. to enjoy going into a deep and profound experience. And each time that you listen to this, you can go deeper and deeper and find it easier to go deeper quicker with each listening that you do. And as your body deeply relaxes, so you can begin to relax as a mind, and before you begin to relax as a mind, I'm just going to count down from 20, and with each count, you can go one twentieth of the way even deeper. And I don't know whether you'll notice how much deeper you're going or whether you'll just go deeper and deeper with each count and find that your breathing softens, relaxes and gets deeper and deeper. Almost like that breathing you do when you're deeply asleep where you breathe rhythmically deeply from the stomach, where your body is totally still, relaxed, where you lose all awareness of your body as you drift comfortably into a dream. And you can continue to follow along to what I'm saying. And I don't know whether you'll drift deeper and more profoundly with the words that I'm using or the spaces between my words. As I count down from 20, 19, 18, 17, going deeper and deeper, 16, deeper and deeper, 
15, 14, that's it, 13, 12, 11, 10, that's it, 9, Eight, knowing each time you hear me count down, you go deeper and deeper. Seven, six, five, that's it, all the way. Four, three, two, one, that's it, all the way, all the way to a deep and comfortable trance, that's it. And in your mind you can imagine yourself walking through a meadow, and as you walk through that meadow, you can gaze around and you can notice the colour of the sky you can notice trees off in the distance you can notice the movement of the grass the different flowers and other things you can see there, feeling the air on your face, perhaps noticing the temperature and the sensation of walking through the meadow, what each footstep feels like, the sound of each footstep sensation of moving your legs with each step you take. The way your arms move as you walk. And as you walk through this meadow, so you go deeper and more comfortably into this state. And you can walk through the meadow toward a gate that's at the far side of the meadow that takes you into the trees, into the woodland. And you walk through that gate going deeper and deeper and notice how the sounds change. There's different bird sounds in the woodland. There's the sounds of rustling leaves. Light can dance in front of you as it passes through the trees. There are sounds of animals, sounds of a breeze. As you walk deeper into the woodland, relaxing deeper into the woodland, and notice how your footsteps sound different walking into the woodland compared to out in the meadow, on this firmer ground, and the footsteps feel different, a slight more thud to each footstep. As you walk through this woodland, going deeper and deeper into the woods, feeling calmer, more relaxed, listening to nature around you, breathing, relaxing, drifting asleep, breathing, relaxing, Drifting asleep, 
almost like that thought is going around in your unconscious, breathing, relaxing, drifting asleep. As you continue to walk through this woodland, going deeper and deeper, and as you continue to walk through this woodland, so I wonder whether you'll notice that distant stream, and as you begin to notice that distant stream, perhaps noticing the sound in the distance first, or maybe noticing the slight change to the smell of the air, that slight fresh water smell, you can begin to walk instinctively, unconsciously towards that stream. And as you approach the stream, so the sound of the water gets louder and you can notice what that water sounds like how you can judge the speed of the flow of the stream by the sound of the water. And, and as you come to that clearing and you find that stream, you can notice how the area is lighter than it was in the woods. And you can have a sense that it's time to rest. And so you sit down by a tree. You rest your back against the bark of the tree. You take a few deep, comfortable breaths. And drift deeper into your mind. You take a moment to close your eyes by the stream. And you listen to the sound of that water passing by. You pay close attention to the sound of that water, noticing the individual elements of the sound that make up the flowing water. And as you focus so intensely on the sound of the stream, So your mind begins to wander. And you begin to have a sense of drifting off in a reverie in your mind. Drifting off some place in your mind going deeper and more profoundly asleep. And, and as you drift deeper and more profoundly asleep. You find yourself looking out of a window in a palace, gazing out over a land, seeing an old kingdom below, a village of old houses, kind of medieval looking, the sounds of blacksmith working in the distance, the chinking sound of working metal, the sounds of horses trotting along pulling carts, the distant murmur of people talking and hustle and bustle down in the village the sounds of the nature surrounding the area. And feeling the cool stone under your hands as you touch the frame and the windowsill and the area you're looking out of 
as you gaze out across that land, before working your way down the stairs, down a spiral staircase to get to the main hall that leads towards the exit of the building. As you go down the spiral staircase, 20, 19, 18, going all the way down that staircase, hearing the echo of each footstep, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, halfway down that spiral staircase, 9, 8, 7, feeling the banister, aware of what the walls look like, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, being at the foot of those stairs, hearing the echoing of the footsteps as you walk out into the hall and walk across that vast open space, the echoing of the footsteps around the stone. That's it. And you walk towards the exit of the palace, seeing those huge wooden doors and being surprised at how heavy they feel and yet how smooth and easy they are to open. As you push them open, hear the echo behind you of the doors being opened. As you leave that palace and head down towards the village and you walk down, following the path, out of your palace, down towards the village. With the murmur of people getting louder, and the sounds of the village getting louder. And you walk into the village and look around and see how people are dressed. See what the buildings look like. Feel how each footstep feels on the slightly soggy mud. As you walk through the village, out the other side of the village, continuing on to the woodland, and you head into this woodland, and you feel like you're heading into the woodland with intent. Although you don't yet know what's driving you forward and deeper and deeper into the woodland. And you walk into the woodland. And notice how not long after walking into the woodland, the woods shelter you from the sounds behind you. And the village sounds begin to fade away in the background as natural nature sounds begin to increase. As you walk through the woodland and you find a clearing, and in that clearing you just see one lone tree, and you feel compelled to walk to that tree you walk all the way over to that tree, you reach out, run your fingertips gently around the bark of the tree, and then find an entrance into the tree. You head down a spiral staircase, deep down under the tree. You follow that spiral staircase down, all the way down deeply under the tree, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 
12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all the way. Where you find a door. You open that door, you walk through that door. And the door slowly closes behind you. And you see a seat and you walk over and you sit in that seat. And as you sit there, so you feel deeper and deeper relaxed. You feel yourself drifting. Drifting, dreaming, floating somewhere deep and profound and you don't know where. All you know is this is where you're supposed to be right now. And you drift into a deep and comfortable sleep. And in that sleep, you find yourself stood in front of a door and it's an unusual door it's a door in the middle of nowhere and you walk around the door and it seems to be just a door frame with a door in it you can walk around behind it you can walk around beside it in front of it it seems to be a door that goes nowhere and yet here you are and because here you are in front of this door that seems to go nowhere you decide to open the door you've walked around the door there's nothing either side nothing behind it nothing in front of it you decide the only thing you haven't done is gone through it you open the door and there's just darkness the other side of the door And yet you know there's nothing the other side of the door. And you feel this sense of comfort coming from this place. This sense of deep relaxation. This sense that entering the door is going to give you some profound insight, understanding, wisdom. is going to help you sleep even deeper and learn a dream and you walk into that blackness and discover you've entered a room of nothingness no up, no down, no left, no right the only thing there seems to be is another door off in the distance and somehow just by thinking about it you move through this room of nothingness where there's no past, no present, no future where it seems to be no space or time apart from thought being able to drive you to that door or is it making that door come to you in this room you can't tell and when the door and your hand meet you can feel the handle feel what that handle feels like as you slowly and carefully open the door and as you open the door, so you instinctively seem to drift deeper and float through that door. Finding yourself in a deeper level of nothingness. And passing through that door. Again you see a door in the distance 
and you can't tell whether you're moving to the door or the door is moving to you. All you know is you don't seem to be walking on anything. There seems to be no time, no space. No up, no down, no left, no right, no forward, no backward. And yet here you are. Just willing that door closer and willing yourself closer to that door and somehow the two of you meet. And you reach out for the handle again and you open the door and you pass into a third, even deeper level of nothingness. That's it. And something strange happens as you pass through this door. You're aware that you're in a place of nothingness, and yet something seems to be forming. It's as if reality is forming around you, out of nothing. As if time is starting around you, out of nothing. Then you start to feel a slight swaying, a slight rocking motion. You start to smell the smell of fresh water. You start to hear the sounds of birds. You start to feel the warmth of sun on your skin. You start to hear the sound of rustling leaves in the distance. And hear the slight sloshing sound of water. And you start to realize you're relaxing in a rowing boat, lying down in a rowing boat, that's sitting in the middle of a lake, gazing up at the sky, feeling deeply relaxed, profoundly relaxed, curious about this world you've created from nothing, this reality that sprung into existence from thought alone. And you start to feel like the last time you felt like this was in the middle of a dream, where everything makes sense in the dream, regardless of how strange. And you sit up slightly and you gaze around. You can see over to the shore of the lake. You can see the woods. You can notice the colour of the water. And you can reach down into the water and touch the water with your fingers. Notice the feeling of the water, the temperature of the water. As you relax and drift and dream deeper and more profoundly asleep. And you row the boat gently to shore. You row, row, row the boat gently to shore. That's it. And once the boat reaches the shore, you place the oars in the boat. Climb out of the boat onto the shore and begin to explore. And as you explore through the woodland, so you discover what seems to be a cave like a mound within the woodland and within that mound is a cave and you see a 
stick that would be suitable to be a torch. You light that stick and you walk into the cave. You notice the way that shadows dance around the walls of the cave as you walk deeper and more profoundly into the cave. The way your footsteps begin to echo in the cave, the echoing sound of distant drops of water in the cave, the slight whistling of the wind that's blowing in the cave entrance, the flickering of the flame, the distant sound of the woodland fading away as you go deeper and deeper asleep. As you walk deeper and deeper into this cave, and you walk over and explore the walls of the cave, reach out, feel the walls, run your fingers along the walls, noticing the texture, the temperature, Noticing what each footstep feels like as you walk deeper into the cave. Unsure what you're going to find here. And then deep inside this cave. You notice that it opens up into a room and in the middle of that room is a stand and on that stand is an ancient looking book and you head over to that book you carefully open the book and you start reading that book and you notice that book is full of deep wisdom. And the book starts by saying that it reveals the knowledge of the collective unconscious. That there's universal wisdom that we know deep inside us. You just have to go deep enough to learn it. And here in this cave is deep in that wisdom. Deep in the unconscious. Learning about truth and beauty and love. And as you read, you discover so many positive things from that book. Aha moments. Reading and exploring that book. about being the best you, you can be. And how to work with the life around you. Bringing joy and happiness to others. Connecting to others in profound ways that spreads happiness. And the book shares about happiness being the journey, not the destination. Wisdom being the journey, 
not the destination. Life being the journey, not the destination. Curiosity being the journey, not the destination. And unconsciously, you begin to absorb all this knowledge deep and profoundly while drifting deeper and more profoundly asleep. And after you've reached the end of that book, you feel that knowledge within you. You feel that knowledge on your face, in your mind, in your soul, in your heart, in your stomach. You feel like all of your brains are connected are in sync with each other. You begin to know how to have harmony with yourself, with the world, with your environment, with others, with the story that you're a part of, and the story you want others to tell in the future of you. And you begin to find your way out of that cave. And as you find your way back out to the woods, you decide you want to explore, be curious. Find your path. And so you head towards the mountains. You carve your way through the woodland. Finding your way to the foot of some mountains. And you begin to climb. And you climb into those mountains. Above the tree line, looking down over where you've come from down to that lake, over the woodland, climbing higher and higher, up through the snow where everything reminds you of that room of nothingness, but this time it's all white, as you head higher and higher up the mountain. Feeling a sense of achievement, Feeling like this climbing, handling the challenges you're facing, working out the way to keep motivated, the way to keep moving forward, the way to get to the top. You find you're learning deeply from this experience as you climb higher up the mountain, learning about the journey, managing your expectations, being proud of your achievements, only judged against yourself, not others, as you continue to climb. learning to breathe in certain ways and think in certain ways that help you to navigate anxiety and stress as you continue to climb. That help you to see things as challenges to be worked through and worked out. And then what you can learn from where you take the wrong route, 
from where things don't quite go right. And how you find the positives in those things as you continue to climb. And by the end, up the mountain, you look back, see how far you've come. You look back and notice the areas on your climb, where you stumbled, where you fell a little, where you struggled, where you failed. What you learned from those failures, how you moved forward. How you kept motivated, even when it felt like you just kept failing over and over again. Even when it felt like things just weren't going right and perhaps may never go right, and you may never make it to the top. You look back and see how you turned them into learning opportunities and found your way through those challenges, back to a point where you can carry on your upward climb. And you can see those points where at times you had to just stop and think, I can't climb any further right now. And you had to wait. And you had to get to the right place in your mind and body before continuing the climb. And you can look back and see all that now. From the top, how far you've come, all that you've achieved. And when you reach the top of that mountain, you notice something strange. There's another door that appears to go nowhere. Another door you can walk around. And so you open the door and just see blackness. You walk through that door and find yourself in a room of nothingness again. And you pass through that room of nothingness somehow drawn to another door or the other door is drawn to you. You pass through that door of nothingness. Feeling drawn to another door or the door is drawn to you. And then you open a door and find yourself stood by that stream Seeing yourself lying there relaxing, sleeping by that stream, looking so peaceful, calm, relaxed. Seeing yourself fast asleep there, watching that you sleep soundly and deeply, knowing that that you there is on all that adventure that the you here, who's timeless, who's just an observer, is aware of what that you there is going through and experiencing, but unsure of what part of the experience that you there is in right now. And while you look at yourself, you notice how peaceful, calm you look, resting there fast asleep, resting there so deeply, so soundly asleep. You think about how you look peaceful, resting fast asleep there now. And you decide that you'd like to join that you in that sleep. And so you rest yourself down where that you is. Almost like you're a body made of just energy. And nothing physical or tangible. 
and that you can just place yourself down into that you lying there knowing that you can sleep for as long as you need to sleep for as long as you want to sleep to awaken in your own time at a time that you know you want to awaken at feeling fully refreshed revitalized having found your way all the way back through the experience the way you came in to this point by the stream but for now knowing that you can take all the time you want to relax in a healing deeply healing profound sleep so as you take a moment to get yourself comfortable and allow your eyes to gently close and with your eyes gently closed you can begin to relax and as you begin to relax you can start to fall comfortably asleep and while you fall comfortably asleep I'm just going to tell you a story in the background and at times your awareness can perhaps be on the story on elements of the story and at other times your mind can perhaps wander as you drift deeper and deeper asleep. So one day there was a child walking along. They're a youngish child and they're walking along a long road. And they were perfectly comfortable walking along this long road, just enjoying the journey. And the parent was aware that this child was safe and fine. This child knew where they were going. They weren't far from home. But because they were a child, this road seemed so long. And after a while of walking along this long road, they turned into a little park down the road. And it was a beautiful sunny day. They could feel the warmth of the sun on their face on their skin they could hear the sounds of birds in the trees the sound of the wind blowing a breeze and other background sounds in the distance And in this little park, they saw a tree and they went over to that tree and they'd been to that tree numerous times before. And there was something magical about this tree. As so they went over to that tree, they reached out, they ran their fingers gently around the bark as they circled the tree. They looked up at the leaves, could hear the rustling. They looked around them. They took in the atmosphere before getting down onto their hands and knees and crawling into a hole in the tree. And as they crawled into that hole, you would think that they would reach the back of the tree and that their head would knock the back of the tree, but it didn't. They crawled into the hole and the other side of the hole was a strange new world 
was a strange land that they had visited before on previous times, crawling into the hole. And they think that they're probably the only one who knows about this strange land the other side of the hole. And so they crawled all the way through the hole, coming out in this strange land. And the sky had a certain different coloured tinge to it. The grass looked different. And there was something strange about the way that everything seemed to be in reverse or backwards in some way compared to the world they'd come from. And when they turned back and looked at where they'd crawled through, they could just see a tree that looked very similar to the tree they crawled through. And they could see the hole in the tree. And they could run their fingers around the bark of this tree. But they couldn't hear any rustling leaves. And yet they could see the movement. And as they'd done before, they decided to explore. They explored around this land, wandering across the field, heading towards some trees. And when they reached the trees, they descended a bank just the other side of the tree line, following the trees down this bank, down towards a babbling brook. And they climbed all the way down to that babbling brook and gently followed that babbling brook deeper into the experience. And as they followed that babbling brook deeper into the experience, so they felt a sense of calm, of peace, of wonder and curiosity. And they knew what they were searching for, or rather, where. And they continued to follow that babbling brook. And after a while, that babbling brook opened out into a lake. And the lake created a clearing among the trees. And around the lake, was a small meadow and they walked around the lake and they looked up and they looked around and they could see the trees and they could see how the trees rose as the trees around this area all climbed the hills and the sun shone from high up glistening on the water and they sat down by that water and they got their teddy bear out their backpack they got a blanket out their backpack they got some cups and a teapot some plates and some food And they began to have a teddy bear's tea party. A teddy bear's picnic out here in this strange land. And they offered their bear some tea, some cake. But they found that they were probably eating 
more of the tea and cake than the bear was. And they lay back on the blanket, resting their head on their backpack, listening to sounds, feeling the breeze, watching the water, noticing how the sky here had a strange different coloured tinge to it that let them know they were somewhere curious. And when they go out to play, they frequently came to this location and sat here and spent time with their teddy. And they enjoyed this time with their teddy. It helped them to feel peaceful, to feel calm. This child was autistic and found that normally the world was an overwhelming place and yet here was a space where they could relax, where they could help to calm their senses. And the slightly coloured tinge to the atmosphere helped just to dim the light enough so that they felt calm here. And the way that Things didn't make the same noise. And there wasn't lots of people or lots of movement. And it gave them a chance to spend time with their friend, spend time with Teddy. And they'd practice having conversations with Teddy, offering Teddy drinks, saying please and thank you, interacting with Teddy. They knew these were all skills they were going to need to learn for the future. And as they relaxed here, they felt as if somehow time stood still. And they were sure time did actually stand still. Because while they were here, they'd feel that no time had passed. They would feel like they'd been there just for a moment or two. And yet they would be aware that they did quite a lot and so must have been there for longer. And yet when they left this land, they'd find that very little time had passed in the real world. They hadn't been gone long and they found this really curious and they didn't know if this was because of the land they were in or because of the focus they had while they interacted with Teddy. And after spending some time with Teddy, having a picnic, having some tea, while they rested back with their head on their backpack, they let their eyes close for a moment. 
they took some deep and comfortable breaths and allowed themselves just to drift off gently asleep for a moment, initially into a reverie, into a kind of daydream, resting, relaxing, and then from there into some light dreams, and gradually into a sleep. And they enjoyed this relaxing moment of sleep, it gave them a chance to let their mind wander, to let them explore possibilities, to let them be people they aren't normally. And they had this sense of being someone brave in a vast land and they're exploring this vast land, holding a compass. And they're following the, this compass and they've got this idea of where they need to go. And they seem to instinctively know from glancing at the compass where it is they need to go. So they follow this compass. And they trek through this vast land, they trek through desert, aware of the warmth of the air, the dryness of the air, the brightness of the light, they trek through forests, aware of the flickering light from above, how much darker it is in the forest than the desert. They trek through open meadows, over mountains, just sticking to following this compass, knowing where it is they're going, and yet not knowing where it is they're heading because it's just an instinctive thing. They're trekking with purpose. And after some long time of trekking, they see an ancient city and they enter that ancient city and they see an arena, what looks like a gladiator's arena. And they march into that arena with purpose. And this experience to this child is like a lucid dream. They have some awareness over what it is they're doing, some control over it, but they're largely just letting it play out almost like a movie that they're experiencing as this character, seeing what this character saw, hearing what this character heard. And so they enter that gladiator's arena, unaware of what's going to happen next. And from within the arena, they can hear lots of loud cheering and they find this a little overwhelming but they focus on just being present in the arena so that it's almost like all the noise of the shouting of the people becomes distant background noise almost like white noise And they're aware of the brightness of the sun. And how difficult it is to focus with such bright light. And again, they narrow their focus on being in the moment. 
focusing their eyes lower and learning and practicing to have it so that they don't attend to the light. So the light's there, they just aren't paying it attention. And then they hear a roar. And they see a lion jump out of a hole in the ground. And the lion's on a chain and looks angry. And they feel like they're probably going to be expected to fight this lion. But instead they walk over to the lion. They rest their hand on the lion's neck. They focus on the breathing of the lion. And they breathe the same as the lion. They focus on calming, on comfort, on being one with the lion, on understanding the lion's needs. On falling into sync with the lion. And this synchronizing with the lion silences the crowds as they watch in awe and wonder at what they've just seen, that they are expecting a fight. And instead of fighting, this person came alongside the lion and tamed the lion. And to the audience, it looked like they tamed the lion with just a touch because the audience were unaware of the connection this person had with the lion through that touch and the understanding this person had on a deep level with that lion and the lion lay down on the ground almost purring And the person rested their hand there in a firm, comforting way. And nobody knew how to react to this event. And the person just walked away from the lion, unlocking the chain as they went. And they left the arena by a different exit and continued their journey. They continued their journey searching and they didn't know what for. And they walked through more open land they travelled over the sea until eventually they arrived at Egypt and at Egypt they noticed how fertile the land was around the Nile they saw the great pyramids how bright and white and smooth they were They walked to the great pyramids. They ran their hands around the different pyramids, feeling the smoothness of the rock. And they continued to search. And eventually, they found a temple. They entered that temple descended deep underground into that temple, lighting torches as they went to light their way. A 
and deep underground in that temple. They found a glowing ancient tablet. And they went to that glowing ancient tablet, ran their fingers over the hieroglyphs, and they felt this sensation of understanding. And they realized that it was teaching them about connection. about the secret language, the unspoken rules of communicating with others. And they learned about this. And they realized that they had this with the lion. They had this with other animals. But this was teaching how to have this with people. And after some time of learning and meditating on these texts, the scene began to fade away. And the child began to be aware of his surroundings. began to notice sounds, feel the feeling of wind, of the sun, and then awakening in this unusual land, lying next to Teddy on this blanket. The child took some time to pack everything up. And looked around one last time, make sure they didn't forget anything. And just to take it all in, never knowing whether this place will be here the next time they try to come here. So every time they leave, they like to just take it all in, in case it's the last time they'll be here. And then they start working their way back. They find their way back to the babbling brook. They follow that babbling brook. All the way back through the woods finding their way all the way back to that tree. They crawl through the tree. They come out in that initial meadow, in that initial park. They cross that park back to that long road. The sun in the sky appears to be pretty much where it was when they last saw it. They can hear all the sounds of the street, the harsh bright light, sounds of animals rustling leaves, sounds of chattering people. And they follow that long road all the way home. They walk past their parent. Their parent says hello. And asks if they enjoyed themselves. They let the parent know it was okay. As they head up to their room, settle down in their bed, and begin to imagine 
being back next to that lake and begin to imagine drifting back into that reverie they had, into that dream they had while they were next to that lake, wanting to recapture that and explore that world further. and learn from that world further. And as they do this, they find themselves drifting, floating, relaxing, comfortably asleep. Okay, so take a moment to allow your eyes to close and to begin to Comfortably drift asleep. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, you can listen to me talking to you in the background. And as you listen to me and follow along to this story, you can just drift and float and dream and comfortably fall asleep. And you can have a sense of somebody walking through some woodland and as they walk through that woodland they're following a wooded path they've got trees towering overhead the rustling of the leaves the sound of each footstep they take and as they take each footstep so they go deeper and deeper into the woods. And while they're walking deeper and deeper into the woods, they can hear the sounds of birds around them, hearing the distant sound of some pheasants, walking deeper and deeper into the woodland, hearing scurrying sounds, smelling the sounds of the woodland. As they continue to walk deeper and deeper, and they notice the way that as the woodland becomes more dense, it becomes slightly darker, and there's just the dancing light of the sun as it manages to grab a few shards through the leaves above. Dancing on the path as they walk. And they feel so relaxed walking through this woodland. Just drifting and floating in their mind, wandering having pleasant thoughts as they walk along and occasionally stopping just to touch a tree or two to run their fingers around the bark of the tree notice the different textures the different feelings of different bark on different trees how some smooth and others are rougher and that soft feeling of moss on trees. And while they continue walking deeper into the woodland, they decide to take a turning off the path. Heading into the denser wood. And they know there's some cliffs somewhere off in the distance. They decide to head off towards those cliffs. And so as they walk into that denser woodland. They notice how the sounds change. How with all this woodland around the sounds seem to at the same time become more muffled and yet some sounds seem to echo and reverberate through the woods. 
and they walk deeper and deeper until eventually they find their way to that cliff deep in the woodland and apart from the natural sounds when they're very still there's just silence a slight rustling of leaves as the wind blows across the tops of the trees, but other than that, just silence. And they notice that cliff, they notice how it appears to be made of chalk. And they walk along the side of the cliff they know there's something they're looking for and they're sure they're going to find it. And they walk along the side of that cliff until eventually they find what looks like a boulder resting against the cliff. And that it looks like that boulder has part of it embedded in the cliff. But they know from some research they did with some old texts about the area that this boulder isn't just something resting against the cliff or even something that is naturally embedded in the cliff. It's a boulder blocking an entrance into a cave. And so, with a tremendous amount of effort, they push and they pull on that boulder, pushing on one side, trying to loosen one side, pulling on the other, then pushing and pulling, and gradually wiggling and worming that boulder out from that cliff until eventually they're able to rest their back against the cliff, give one last push with their feet on that boulder, and move it just enough to allow themselves to notice that there's a gap behind that boulder, not just a gap where the boulder was, but like a tunnel going deep into this cliff. And they get a torch out and they shine that torch into the tunnel and they carefully squeeze themselves between the boulder and the cliff and into that gap and into that tunnel and with excitement they begin to walk inside that cliff face following that tunnel walking deeper and deeper following that tunnel, walking deeper and deeper, noticing how the temperature changes slightly as they walk into the cliff, walk into that tunnel, noticing the darkness other than what's lit up by the torch, and the way the torch illuminates dust particles in the air, and the echoey sound of footsteps and the distant sound of dripping like dripping in a cave as they walk deeper and deeper and while they walk deeper into this tunnel they start to have this sense of something following them and they don't know what or even if something's following them and they feel a little uncertain and unsure about this they don't feel threatened they just feel uncertain unsure about not knowing what's following them or even if something's following them 
or whether it's just a sense that they have. And they walk deeper and deeper. And as they walk deeper, so the sound seems to fade away. Almost like all the sound is muted. Like somehow the sides of the tunnel have perhaps changed material in absorbing the sound rather than allowing sound to echo. And they're sure they can hear the sound of footsteps behind them like a padding of feet. And they decide to stop and wait and face the uncertainty and see what might be there. And as they stop and wait and shine the torch back the way they came, so they notice something initially shadowy in the distance and then getting closer and closer, just calmly and comfortably walking towards them. And they notice it looks like a wolf and as it gets closer and closer they see that it is, that it's the most beautiful white wolf and they feel calm around this wolf they don't feel threatened in any way almost like somehow this was supposed to be a companion of theirs on this journey and they're unsure why this wolf has followed them in here or why they feel like this wolf is supposed to be a companion to them and the wolf sits at their feet and then rests its head down, demonstrating that it's not a threat. And then the two of them carry on the journey, walking further down this tunnel. And they continue walking down this tunnel until they come to a crossroads and there are two paths to take and the wolf walks down one side stops a little way down turns and sits down and the person wonders which route to take and decides that the wolf obviously knows best and so continues following the wolf and as they walk down that tunnel so the tunnel splits again and the wolf makes a decision and then splits again and the wolf makes another decision and they just continue following that wolf, trusting the wolf deeper and deeper into this system of tunnels and it feels like they've been walking for hours deeper and deeper underground Almost like they're walking through some kind of a maze underground that fortunately the wolf seems to know where they're going. And after what felt like hours of walking underground they come across what looks like a doorway with a heavy, solid, wooden door and the wolf sits at the door and the person tries to push the door unsuccessfully tries to pull on the door unsuccessfully and then realises they have to solve a puzzle. That there are bits around the room, bits around the outside of where they are. That they have to move around 
and obviously there's some kind of a locking system. And so they start looking and working out what the pattern must be and then turning things and pushing things in and pulling things out and moving things around in this room until after a while they hear a click and the door naturally just slides open and they walk through that door to discover a grand cave lit up by some kind of a glowing stone that's covering the ceiling of the cave and in fissures down the walls creating a glow in this space and in the center of the cave are some vast abandoned ruins of an ancient civilization And this was what this person came looking for. They'd heard that there was an ancient civilization once here, in this area. And it was at a time that there was a lot of warring going on. And so this civilization had decided to build their civilization underground. And hide it from the world. And they would rarely come out and interact with others. But then something happened that made the civilization die out. And only a few of the civilization survived. And those few went out and spread the word and spread knowledge of the civilization, of their advanced technology for their time their ability to build and keep themselves hidden from the world. And over thousands of years, it just drifted into legend and rumours, and people stopped believing in this civilization. And this person walked over to those ruins. And they're in pretty good condition. And they entered the ruins. And noticed how much gold was all over the walls in the ruins to bounce light around the corridors, around to the different rooms. There was artwork that could have been painted yesterday that was as beautiful as Renaissance art, yet thousands of years earlier. And there were contraptions in some of the artwork that looked unusual, but more modern, and definitely not things from thousands of years ago. And they were hunting for the Grand Library. They'd heard that this specific location, and this specific building, would contain a Grand Library, and the knowledge of the civilization, and the knowledge passed down from previous civilizations to that civilization untouched for thousands of years. And after much searching from room to room, they discovered the Grand Library, containing thousands upon thousands of books, stretching up high, above their head 
and rows and rows of books and all around the outside. And they could see at the far end of the library was a pedestal and on that pedestal was an ornate book. And they went to that book and they couldn't read the writing, they couldn't understand the text, but they could understand the images on the pages, the freshly painted images as they looked. And they could see the tale of times gone by, of land beyond land, creating one huge land mass before the last ice age ended and flooded the vast plain between this land and the rest of the land of civilizations that lived and flourished within the plain and across the vast land and of how quickly that flood came how a wall of ice gave way and in an instant Vast quantities of water flooded and cut off one land from another, destroying everything in its path. And they managed to keep their civilization going, but with the smaller land, new, younger civilizations sprung up tribes sprung up, they grabbed what land there was, they staked their claim, they said this is mine, and they started clinging to things as if they belonged to them, they were no longer of the land, they were now commanding the land and saying the land is theirs. And yet this ancient civilization disagreed that that's the way to be, felt that everything should be open, shared, that more is achieved through peace and collaboration than trying to compete for resources and destroy each other. And so they hid their civilization away for thousands and thousands of years, letting these other civilizations come and go, conquering, receding, being defeated. New conquerors would come in and yet they would all have the same mentality, a mentality of ownership over the environment. And this was always their downfall. But this civilization remaining isolated was destined to gradually die out, very slowly, generation after generation, and so it ended with the last of the civilization going out to spread their word of peace, of love, of kindness and compassion, of working together, bringing down barriers, of self-expression, of being who you want to be.
and of being able to have an attitude of finding solutions to problems, working together collaboratively and facilitating getting the best from each other and utilising each other's strengths. And that's how such a small civilization had survived for so long here. And they brought down all barriers and wanted to share that knowledge with others because they lived in peace, in harmony with the world around them. And the wolf and this person walked out of these ruins, out of that library, out of that building, and continued walking a bit further, where they noticed a chamber opened up into an even more vast area that looked like an underground village. And they could see where this entire civilization had lived, seeing play areas, seeing what the buildings looked like, seeing parks, seeing how they'd managed to capture sunlight from outside and funnel it down to underground, just using natural resources and what can be learned from this civilization. And this person wondered what should they do, should they tell others about this civilization? Or just record what they've discovered for future generations, but not reveal where. And they decided that they would take a few of the books of this civilization as something they can take back to help to educate others and they would just say that they found them somewhere up top on the surface and they wouldn't draw attention to where this civilization was and they found their way all the way back out the way they came following that wolf all the way back to the entrance and once out of the entrance, they sealed that cave up again and walked back through the woods. And they found their way back to the path and the wolf remained with them. And the wolf walked with them as they walked all the way down to a lake. And they sat by that lake for a while they pitched up a tent, cooked some food as the sun set, and the wolf never left them. It became a companion. It seemed to want to spend its time, almost like it was watching over them. And they settled down for the night the flickering flames of the campfire as it burnt down to embers and was just a glow, the lapping sound of water of the lake on the shore, the sound of the breeze on the tent, the distant sounds of nightlife, of birds and bats and other animals at night in the woods. as they relaxed down and drifted and floated deeper and deeper asleep. Just take a moment to get comfortable and allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, I'll just tell this story in the background. And as you listen along to this story, I don't know whether you'll Drift off asleep, 
faster with the sounds of my words or with the spaces between my words. And as you drift comfortably asleep, so I'll just tell the story in the background. And it's a story about a young girl And she's desperate to become a world-class ballet dancer. And so every day she goes down to the halls and practices her moves in front of the mirror. And then every afternoon she heads home often exhausted and relaxes down in front of a fire closes her eyes and imagines her future imagines a future of being in front of an audience in a theatre as a curtain draws back on a stage. A silence falls over the theatre. And a conductor taps and then music starts. And she feels that music, almost like her movements, herself, and the music are one. Where she feels herself moving almost effortlessly, almost like she has no weight to her body. and yet has a certain solidity and a certain groundedness to her body. Almost like she's gliding around the stage, so absorbed in the moment. Where the audience just seems to fade to black the surroundings seem to fade away, almost like there's a spotlight just on her. As she rises up and extends, with a feeling of effortlessness, and twists, pulls her arms in to speed up her spinning, stretching her arms out to slow her spinning. Moving a leg in or out, higher or lower, to control speed and the movement. And twisting in the air, and arching, and swooping up some ribbon and other props, using the props, her movement, her body, to create graceful poses and shapes. Aware of how she almost glides across the stage, knowing that if the music wasn't playing, you'd barely hear a sound from her movement. almost like a ninja 
being able to sneak around. Having so much control of the muscles. Aware of everything that went into that. All the aching. All the effort. And the hard work that went into making this seem so effortless. And as she relaxes in front of that fire, almost mentally rehearsing the future she's striving for. So that allows her body to relax. It allows the tension from the day to pass out of her body. To pass through her shoulders, her neck, down through her body with a sense of relaxation. And as that happens, so her breathing slows. And she starts to drift deeper inside her mind. Exploring this desired future for herself. And when she then settles down for the night to go to bed, she drifts off so comfortably asleep, asleep that's made deeper because of the hard work she's done through the day. A sleep she feels she's earned from that day's work and that day's dancing. And the next morning she awakens feeling refreshed. She leaves her house and she walks down the hill of a country village, down the hill into the centre, to the main street. And as she walks down the hill, so she can hear birds chirping. She can notice the blue sky. Perhaps a few clouds passing by. And she starts to skip a little as she continues down that hill. but not skipping in a random kind of way, but practicing her dancing, taking every moment to truly live as a dancer. And she skips her way down that hill, feeling the breeze on her face, And then down near the bottom of the hill is a bridge over a river. And she crosses that bridge, listening to that rushing water passing under her. And heads into the village. Where the first thing she notices is the smell from the bakery. Where she gets drawn in by that mouth-watering cinnamon bun smell. So she follows that smell, heads around to the bakery. She can smell the early morning cooking of the bread. 
the cinnamon buns, and she heads into the bakery, buys herself a bun, and chats with the baker for a little bit. And the baker enjoys how pleasant and friendly she is, and how kind she is. And she says goodbye to the baker, leaves the bakery, and continues on through the town. And she passes a few other shops and heads down by the market square. And as she approaches the market square, so she notices there's more activity here. People milling around, chatting, laughing, looking for a bargain. And she turns down a street, a very quiet little street, almost like an alleyway. And she sees a little dormouse scurrying along a brick wall. And as the dormouse sees her, so it freezes. And so she freezes. And she then crouches down, breaks off some of her cinnamon bun, crumples it up a little bit, and just rests there, crouched down, with a hand on the ground, and the bits of cinnamon bun resting in the palm of her hand. And she just gazes at a point between herself and the Dormouse and relaxes. And while she relaxes, she allows her breathing to slow and calm. And as it does, so she notices that Dormouse begins to move again. and twitches its nose and seems to show an interest in this strange person who's crouched down in this street and it takes a few steps towards her and then stops and then looks around and then takes a few more steps and stops and looks around and with each few steps so that Dormouse becomes more comfortable and confident that this girl isn't a threat until eventually it works its way all the way over to her hand rests its front feet gently on her finger, holding her finger gently to almost pull itself up a little bit over her hand, and eats some of that cinnamon bun out of her hand. Before letting go of her finger again and scampering back off, And the girl stands up and continues her journey down this street. And she turns out onto the next street and finds her way to the haberdashery. And she loves the smell of the different materials. She loves the feeling 
of going to drawers of different buttons and just plunging her hands into those drawers, pushing her fingers down into the buttons, moving her fingers around, holding a few of the buttons, feeling the smoothness, the softness, the texture of each individual button, feeling the holes of the button with her thumb, touching the different materials, and the ribbons. And the person in this haberdashery makes items of clothing as well. Just simple, quick to make items. And she asks them if they'd take some of their materials, some of their ribbon, and make them a flowy dress. And so she finds the softest, lightest material she can. She gets measured up for a dress. And then they get to work, making up that dress. A dress that will flow, that will flare out whenever she turns. A dress that makes her feel so light, that represents her dancing. And while they work on the dress, so she goes and sits in the corner of the shop. And she sees their new kitten, a little tabby kitten, that nervously at first looks her up and down, before coming over to her, and then sitting by her foot, and then it drops on its side, on the top of her foot. And then, because she doesn't react negatively to it, it climbs its way up her leg, over onto her lap, pushes itself into her lap, and drops itself down, loose and limp, on her lap. And she gently strokes that kitten and can feel the warmth of the kitten, can feel it purring, can hear its purring, can feel it breathing. And can feel its fur in her fingertips. And she wonders to herself whether the kitten is becoming more relaxed because she's stroking that kitten, or whether she is the one becoming more relaxed because of the kitten's relaxation and the purring and the way the kitten's breathing and trusting her. And the two of them together get lost in time, losing track of time, just sitting, enjoying the moment. And while she's just stroking that kitten there, her mind begins to wander. And she begins to drift off into a daydream. 
she begins to imagine herself. All grown up. Staying in. A lodge. In a snowy environment. And just outside this lodge. In a courtyard. Is the most beautiful ice sculpture of a horse, and she admires that ice sculpture, the way movement is captured within the carving of the sculpture, within the way the muscles have been carved, and with the posing of that horse. And she goes and touches that sculpture, feels that ice, feels the coolness of the ice, and the way the ice seems to melt ever so slightly under the warmth of her hands. And she goes out from that lodge on a walk through a forest with snow-covered pine trees and large and light snow falling. And as she walks through this pine forest, smelling that pine smell, she sees in the distance a large red stag pushing its head down through the snow, eating some grass. She walks a bit closer, but doesn't want to disturb it. And so she walks very quietly almost gliding towards that stag. And she can hear the snow cracking under her feet. But she's walking so carefully. She can see the stag breathing, calmly and relaxed. And so she knows she's not disturbing that stag. And as she gets closer, so she notices that the stag has an eye on her. And so it knows that she's there. And yet, it's not afraid, it's staying. And she has her hands out. Loose and limp, but out. So the stag can see she's no threat palms slightly turned towards the stag, head looking away slightly from the stag as she walks towards it. And as she gets very close to that stag, so it lifts its head up and turns to look at her. And only then does she notice how large its antlers are. And yet it still doesn't run. It holds its ground and she walks calmly and non-threatening towards it. And she reaches out one hand towards the side of its neck very slowly, and the stag then moves its head, bringing its neck in contact with her hand, and she can feel the warmth of that stag, the softness of its fur, and she then climbs onto the stag 
almost as if that stag is inviting her to do so. And then the stag starts walking among the pine trees. And she feels so lucky to be just riding so high up on this stag that it's trusting her. And the stag walks her through the pine trees and heads down to a lake. breaks through the ice at the edge of the lake and has a drink from the water and she climbs down from the stag's back she walks a little bit around that lake And she can see, high up in the sky, is an eagle just circling. And she wonders what the eagle must see over such a white and snowy space. And she relaxes back against one of the pine trees and allows herself to drift off into a reverie, focusing on the idea of being that eagle. And then she finds herself seeing through the eyes of an eagle, gazing over a pine forest covered in snow. Noticing how the eagle can notice almost purplish marks going through that snow and can notice tracks through the snow. And she becomes aware that the eagle obviously had a broader range of vision than she does. And she can feel the way the eagle manoeuvres in the air so gracefully, using so little effort, just the slightest movement to increase or decrease speed to raise or lower in the sky, twisting and turning, catching slightly warmer air to rise up. And she realises what she's learning about dancing from this eagle experience. And then almost as soon as the experience began, it feels like it's already going. And she hears that stag letting out a breath that brings her back to the moment. And she climbs on the back of the stag again. and gently nudges the stag with her legs. And using the movement and the pressure of her hands on its neck, just resting gently on the sides of its neck, she communicates to it which directions to go and allows it to take her all the way back to that lodge
and back at the lodge. She goes through to a sweat room. Somewhere that's so warm compared to being out in the cold. And as she relaxes there, so she finds her mind wandering again. But this time, as she has water on her face, from the sweat, from the heat of the room, so she begins to have a sense of being out on a boat, out on the ocean, and she starts to have that feeling of a boat rocking left and right, side to side, on the waves. And then she begins to notice herself on that boat and she can see some land way off in the distance. She can hear some seagulls and she sees a pod of dolphins. And they just seem to be playing, gliding with waves jumping, doing somersaults. And she gets herself into some diving gear, drops off the side of the boat, bobs up and down in the water, swims out a little way from the boat. And one of the dolphins one that looks younger, comes over to investigate her. And as they investigate, she can almost feel them scanning her, almost like they're using their sonar to scan her. As the dolphin in front of her moves its head up and down. And she watches with curiosity the way the dolphin makes the slightest flick of its tail, the slightest movement of one fin or another, to be able to corkscrew through the water, take sharp turns, do backflips, swim upside down, to propel itself out of that water. Doing incredible stunts in the air. And deciding how it lands back in the water. Sometimes with a splash. Sometimes barely creating a wave. And again, she notices what she's learning about her dancing. From watching this dolphin. And she realizes that there are so many answers. There's so much wisdom just in nature. If you just take time to stop. Be in the moment and observe. and broaden your perspective. And the dolphin swims over next to her. As she reaches out one arm, and it swims in to the inside of her arm. And she instinctively holds on to its fin as it pulls her along and they swim along together for a while 
And then after a while, the experience has to come to an end. The dolphin swims her back to the boat. She gets back onto the boat. And relaxes down on that boat. And begins to drift back from that reverie to resting in that room, feeling the warmth of that room, aware of the coldness outside the lodge. And then after a while, she feels a movement on her lap which brings her back from that experience. And she's aware she's still stroking that kitten. And she opens her eyes and sees that her dress is almost made. And so she carefully places the kitten on the floor tries on her dress, twirls in the dress, notices the way the dress fans out and spins around her. And she walks out of this haberdashery, back out onto the street, where a man wearing a tight suit, a fitted suit, with a top hat and a cane, is there to greet her. And he says that she looks like she should dance. And she told him how much she loves to dance, but there's no one here to dance with. And the man in the top hat taps his cane on the ground and the street suddenly changes, the lights suddenly change. The street suddenly becomes clear. And then a man about her age walks across the street towards her. Walking with purpose, with one hand behind his back another hand outstretched, his back straight, neck straight, eyes ahead. And as he walks towards her, so she walks towards him. And just as she's nearing him, he takes a step slightly to the side and she takes a step slightly to the other side. The hands touch, music begins. He puts an arm around her, she puts an arm around him. They stand close and start moving to the music, following that music. Finding poses on beats. And ways of flowing. From note to note. Almost like extended notes created extended movements. Quick notes. Created quick movements. Sometimes the movements were across a few notes. And for a moment, she felt like she was in a world of her own. Just gliding around this street. Just the two of them. Dancing, spinning. Almost like the music, 
themselves and the moment were all the same thing. And then as the music ended, so they separated and were stood just over arm's length apart and the street became normal again and the man with the cane and the top hat was stood there clapping and said to her, you're going to have a bright future. and then disappeared, and she thought that was an unusual experience, and then looked up and found that her dance partner had disappeared, and she was just stood there wearing this new dress, and aware that now most of the day seemed to have gone, so she found her way all the way back home, She rested down in her room. And she noticed on the table in her room was a jigsaw puzzle she'd never seen before. And yet the image on the box was of a dance scene in a location just like where she just danced. And so she opened the box, propped up the lid, and as she allowed herself to become more sleepy, allowed herself to begin to feel tired, She went through the jigsaw pieces, found all the edges, put together the edges of the jigsaw, and then started piecing together the inside of the jigsaw. And she found a piece with a dormouse in an alleyway. She found a section where it looked like the kitten and the haberdashery. And smiling off to one side in the middle of the picture She could see the person in the fitted suit with the cane and the top hat. And next to them, as she put those pieces in place, she could see the person she had just danced with, almost looking like they're smiling at her, invitingly almost like they're trying to invite her into the jigsaw, into the experience. And she feels it's a curious jigsaw. And she puts all the pieces in place, and the last few pieces she puts in place she realizes, reveals the banner that was up in the street. And she notices the date on the banner as being a few years in the future. And she feels this sense that somehow this is something that's meant to be for the future. 
and as she puts that last jigsaw piece in place. So she feels so tired. She decides to go to bed. She gets into bed and dreaming pleasant thoughts of the future. She drifts and relaxes asleep. And just take a moment to get yourself comfortable and allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, I'll tell you a story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll fall asleep faster to the sound of my words or the spaces between my words. But as you begin to drift asleep, so I'll just tell this story. And it's a story about a person who lives in the woods in a cabin. And those woods, it's a, a vast pine wooded area. All snow covered, mountains in the distance. And just down from the cabin is a lake. And this person relaxes in that cabin, in the most comfortable chair, feeling the warmth of a roaring log fire, feeling that warmth on their cheeks. And as they relax, in that chair. So they pick up a book off the table next to the chair and they just start reading through that book, just slowly reading through the book. And although they're reading through the book, a part of them is almost like it's drifted elsewhere. And so they're reading through the book, but at the same time they're almost not reading through the book. Almost unaware of what's going on page by page. And yet they feel themselves still reading, still turning those pages, still relaxing. And out the corner of their eye, they can notice the way the log fire flickers and the way shadows dance on the walls. And they're sitting in this room with low lighting, making this room feel so cozy and comfortable, and they can look over at the window and notice the snow piled up against the window pane, and they can see the snow falling outside. And the way the light from the fire glows in the room as they continue reading that book, drifting and relaxing deeper into the moment. And every now and then they have this feeling like they're starting to nod off in the chair, almost like their head gets a bit heavier, 
their shoulders and neck relax, their arms relax, their breathing slows and calms. And then they bring their attention to the book again, only to find that happen again and again. And they realise after a while that, despite trying to read, they're not really taking it in right now. That watching those words as they scan the pages seems to just help them feel more tired and drift inside their mind. And so they close the book, put it on the table, and they walk over to the window. And they touch the glass with the palm of their hand. They can feel the coolness moving from outside to inside feeling that coolness at their fingertips, their palm, moving into their hand and noticing that as they move their hand so they've left a slightly damp handprint on the window and they sit back down in the chair Have a nice warm drink as they feel more relaxed. They can hear the way the fire's crackling in the background. And they just enjoy being in the moment knowing they're so warm and comfortable here, while outside is cold, and everything's covered with a layer of snow. And they feel themselves beginning to drift inside the mind. They feel their eyes getting heavier with each blink until eventually their eyes blink and don't open again. They just continue to drift deeper inside and relax further. And as they drift inside their mind so they can Notice the way lights dancing outside their eyelids. They can hear what sounds like an owl hooting in a nearby tree. And with their eyes closed, they begin to focus their attention on that sound of the owl. Focusing on where in space that owl is. And as they focus on that owl, so they begin to have a sense of being that owl, seeing what that owl can see. Hearing the wind whistle past their ears. Feeling the movement of the feathers as the wind blows through the tree. And as the owl, they gaze out over the vast white expanse. 
down towards the lake. And they can't see as far as the lake because of the snow, but they gaze in that direction. They notice some movement out there of other animals out here in this pine woodland. And as the wind dies down a little, so the snow begins to fall softly downwards. And as that snow falls softly downwards, so the owl decides to launch silently off that branch, stretch its wings, and glide down and swerve and swoop around, circling, exploring, listening. And as that owl circles so easily and effortlessly and so quietly so it can move its head and hear the footsteps of different animals. And it can see different animals. And the owl notices an unusual animal, an animal it's never seen before. It seems to be the wrong colour for being out here in the snow. And the owl circles around that animal trying to figure out what it is. It's a small animal and it looks cold. And the owl doesn't know what it is, doesn't realize that that animal is a gerbil. But it wants to help and it swoops down, picks up that gerbil and flies it up into its tree, placing it on a branch. And the gerbil appears scared and cold. And the owl explains that in this weather, at this time, it's here to help. It's wise, it often knows what to do. It's often called upon to help. And the gerbil, with a bit of a chatter, explains that they'd wandered off out of their home, decided to go exploring and then got lost. And that for a while it wasn't too bad. They could find things to eat. They were able to explore. And they thought they'd eventually find their own way home. But then this snow came. And the snow seemed to come out of nowhere. And everything went white. And cold. And 
and they didn't know how to find their way back home. But with it being so cold, they panicked and just tried their best. And the owl asked them what their home is like. And they said that it was a warm place with a crackling log fire. Some large animal walking around not talking much, often lost in thought. And looking at different things and sitting in a chair. And the owl realised this animal must have come from the cabin in these woods. So the owl picked up that gerbil, leapt off the branch, stretched its wings and flew with such silence through the snowy sky. until it could see the glow of orangey-yellow light. And then the outline of the cabin. And the gerbil said, that's my home. That's where I came from. And the owl took that gerbil up to the door, placed it on the snow, and the gerbil was so light it didn't sink into the snow, and the owl sunk a little bit into the snow, and then the owl fluttered against the door and knocked its beak on the door until it could hear movement coming from inside the cabin. And then the owl turned and took off and flew out of sight. And the person in the cabin was in his reverie, still trying to pinpoint that owl, still focusing on trying to see what the owl sees. And this experience he's just had feels confusing. The experience feels confusing because he's sure He's just imagined himself as the owl, picking up a gerbil, talking to a gerbil, and flying his pet gerbil back to his cabin. And then at the point that he's imagined this happening, he hears what's in his mind's eye happening at his door. And he's unsure whether the sound he hears at his door is also in his mind. And so he opens his eyes, breaking his connection with the owl. And he still hears the noise at the door. So he gets out of the chair. He walks to the door, opens the door, feels that cold air as it rushes in, 
and sees his gerbil shivering in the snow. And he reaches down and he picks his gerbil up. And he'd wondered where the gerbil had gone. And he goes and stands near the fire, holding that cold gerbil, stroking the gerbil, holding it against him, letting his body warmth warm that gerbil. And then sits down in the chair and just has it resting on his lap. As it rests there, relaxing, and he strokes that gerbil. And back outside, that owl flies back to its tree. and continues to just watch this evening unfold. And while the owl watches the evening unfold, so the snow begins to pass. And as the clouds clear, so the owl notices the sky. notices a blanket of twinkling stars, notices that now the clouds are clearing, that not only are there lights in the sky from an aurora, but there's also shooting stars heading in all directions. And the owl is sure that they hear those shooting stars fizzing as they travel across the sky. And some of those shooting stars are quite large and bright. But most are just like someone drawing a line in the sky that's being erased almost as far as it's drawn. Drawing that line in the sky, being erased almost as fast as it's being drawn. And the owl just watches and relaxes and admires the beauty of where they live. And while the owl relaxes in the tree, so elsewhere in the forest, elsewhere in these woods, another animal is out walking through the snow. And it's a thickly coated snow fox. pushing through the powdery snow, occasionally crunching through some slightly squished down top surface snow. It's almost like snow with a shell. And this snow fox isn't particularly bothered by this cold. It pushes through chin deep through this snow, occasionally finding bits to eat. And then it finds its way to a tree, and the tree has a hole in the bottom, 
and that snow fox decides to explore inside that tree. And as it enters that tree, so it's surprised to see another fox sleeping. A fox that's the most beautiful red colour. And that fox seems to be sleeping among leaves. Another vegetation. Making this quite a warm area to sleep. And that snow fox is curious about this red fox. The snow fox had never seen a fox of that colour, had only ever seen other white foxes. And it didn't know whether to wake that fox or not. And so for now it decided it would mark this tree let the fox sleep and then come back as the snow begins to clear at the point where it would normally travel off elsewhere it'll come back here to meet this fox and the person in that cabin puts that gerbil back into its cage, decides it's going to have to be more careful this time, and hope that gerbil won't walk off and wander off and get lost again. The person didn't even want to think about how that gerbil came to arrive home back at the cabin. didn't want to think about the fact that there could be talking animals out there and that they could have had a connection with those animals and they had to go out and gather some bits from down by the lake and run a few errands. So they wrapped up in a warm, thick jacket. Thick trousers, and boots, and gloves. They left the cabin, crunched through the snow, walking round the side of the cabin. They got on to their snowmobile, turned that snowmobile on, and rode it down towards the lake. And they pulled it up near the lake, grabbed some firewood from a shed near the lake, placed that firewood on the back of the snowmobile before then setting off into the woods following a track into the woods and snow was spraying up behind the snowmobile and they wished that the snowmobile was quieter and they would have walked running these errands but the snowmobile is so much easier than dragging firewood up to your cabin and running errands on foot in this weather
And as they traveled through the woods, so the full moon in the sky sent silver shards of light dancing through the trees on the path in front of them. And as they found a clearing, they came to a halt for a while to admire the view of that bright full moon in the sky. The way it illuminated the snow made the snow appear to sparkle like the surface of that snow is covered in millions of diamonds. And they looked around and they looked in the other direction. They could see the aurora in the sky, shooting stars, and all the normal stars up there twinkling. and they sat themselves down on the snow for a moment and then lay back on the snow just looking up so warm in their coat trousers just gazing up at the sky noticing their breath rise from their mouth with each out-breath as they gaze up at that night sky and while gazing up at the night sky so they started thinking about these animals thinking about how the owl and the gerbil seem to talk to each other thinking about whether that could be real and just coincidence that the gerbil was dropped off on the doorstep or whether what they imagined actually happened and they continued their journey back on that snowmobile heading down to a small village not far from where they live and they followed this track through some clearing through woodland until it reached what could almost be described as a road and they continued to follow this and they could see the small village in the distance and as they were heading down towards it they imagined it would make a perfect Christmas card taking a photo from here of that village the lights on in the village, the glow of the village and they headed down into that village. And they pulled up their snowmobile near a village hall and went into that village hall where there are other villagers here, other locals from places near this village. And they're all here to put on a bit of a show. And this person's job was to play a xylophone as part of a musical act. And a part of his mind was still spent wondering about those animals, about his experiences from earlier in the evening. But 
But he went and set himself up with a xylophone. He took off his outerwear. And different people had done different performances. And then it was his turn with a couple of others. And so he started playing out some music. Initially something really easy, almost like just doing chopsticks on that xylophone. Whenever he played the xylophone and his reasons the reasons for getting into playing the xylophone is that they thought it sounded like children's cartoon interpretations of skeletons and their bones. And that had always made them laugh. And so they couldn't help themselves, they had to learn to play. And so they initially played a couple of very simple tunes, making sure the audience didn't have high expectations. And then started surprising the audience by transitioning into fast paced rock and roll sounding tunes like traditional 1950s rock and roll on a xylophone and Johnny Be Good Blue Suede Shoes they knew this would stun the audience and hopefully entertain. They'd always work up a sweat to do this, but they'd worked hard to achieve this. And after they'd finished, the evening carried on. They mixed with others in the hall, chatted, laughed, socialised for a while. They felt uncomfortable with socialising, but felt that having an icebreaker, even something where people are laughing at something they've done intentionally, like at how surprised they are by that performance, would be an icebreaker that would help them to have a conversation starter, something to talk about. And they enjoyed bonding with this one person there, talking with this one person, sharing experiences, especially on nights like this, where it's cold and the desire is just to say sitting in a chair in front of a roaring log fire, reading and then drifting asleep. Nights like this would encourage them to go out to mix with others. And to encourage them to do things they ordinarily wouldn't, but know they would enjoy if they did. And after their evening of fun, so they went back, got on their snowmobile, and made the journey all the way back to their cabin. They carried in the wood, and they settled down in front of that fire. They had a warm drink. 
before heading off to bed and falling comfortably asleep. And as they drifted comfortably asleep, so they processed the day, processed their experiences, what they learned from the day. And they processed all this in their dreams. And as they processed this in their dreams, they began to have a sense of walking through somewhere warm, almost the polar opposite of their real environment. They had a sense of climbing up a ladder and walking into the Sphinx's mouth in the middle of a desert. And inside this Sphinx, they saw a lion and a tiger, both of which were almost as big as this person was stood tall. And they were taken aback by this experience as the lion and tiger just sat down and then lied down and then both rolled on their sides and then on their backs. And the person felt this sense of comfort around this lion and this tiger and couldn't explain why there was a lion and a tiger in the belly of the Sphinx, but walked up to the two of them, reached down and started stroking and scratching both their bellies at once. And was shocked by the bizarre purring sound of the lion and the tiger. That it was deeper and nothing like the sound of a pet cat. And they could feel the warmth. And that these animals seem to just want love and affection. And that they may appear scary, but actually, just because they're scary in one setting, doesn't mean they're evil or bad. They have their nature and their nature includes wanting affection, wanting love and connection. And when the person lifted the hands off the lion and the tiger both of them almost instantly made a noise that sounded like a disapproving low rumble. And they thought to themselves, just like when you scratch or stroke any animal, once you start, they just want you to keep going and get annoyed if you stop. So they sat down for a while on the floor with the cats, just stroking and rubbing the bellies of those cats, thinking this is the most unusual experience or dream. But they continued anyway, knowing this is teaching something. It's their mind's way of teaching them something.
and eventually the sphinx began to disappear around them and the cats beneath both their hands began to fade away and the world began to extend out into the most beautiful lush green valley with a lake and a waterfall pouring down into that lake and at the foot of the waterfall they could notice the way the sun was shining through the spray was creating a rainbow and as they neared that waterfall they could feel the spray reaching their face the coolness of that water and they went and sat down near the waterfall sat down near the lake and started gazing at the rainbow hovering in the spray and as they gazed at that rainbow so the waterfall appeared to be falling upwards and whenever they looked at it directly they could see that it was falling down but when they gazed at the rainbow and had their peripheral vision noticing the water, the water seemed to be rising up, almost like time was in reverse. And they were highly curious about this. They didn't know if it was an optical illusion caused by the way they're viewing it out of the corner of their eye versus looking directly at it. And they picked up some sticks and they walked around near the waterfall, climbed their way up to the top of the waterfall They walked some way along the river at the top of the waterfall. They then threw one stick in. They waited a minute and then threw the other stick in. And those sticks were far enough away that they were just moving very slowly in the direction of the waterfall. But they knew the closer the sticks get to the waterfall, the faster those sticks will move. And that gave them time to climb back down again. And they went and sat where they were before, when they watched the rainbow. And they watched as the first stick came over the waterfall and they continued to watch the rainbow and watch the stick fall out the corner of their eye. And they wondered what would happen because if everything's moving backwards as it seems, for real, that stick shouldn't fall over the waterfall. But if it's an optical illusion, somehow that stick will fall over the waterfall and they saw that stick appear at the top of the waterfall as it falls over the waterfall and the water continued to appear to flow upwards as that stick fell downwards a 
and then they looked at the waterfall. As the second stick arrived, and the waterfall was flowing downwards while they looked directly at it. And just as they expected, that stick came over the waterfall, perfectly normal. And they thought to themselves, oh, that's okay. It was just a simple optical illusion. And as they thought that, so the colours from the rainbow fell out the water and started filling the lake and then flowing through the mist from the waterfall flowing through the spray and then spreading up the waterfall until the waterfall just looked like a solid rainbow with some translucency to it pouring down and into a lake and they knew this was no optical illusion. This was just odd. But they enjoyed watching as they saw those colours spread and start to make the whole meadow, all the grassland appear vibrant and colourful. as colourful birds took off in the distance. And the sky started taking on multiple hues and they drifted deeper and deeper asleep. And then they drifted into an even deeper sleep, drifting out of a dreaming sleep into their healing recuperative sleep, going through the usual stages of nightly sleep, from dreaming sleep to deep healing sleep, and then some more dreaming sleep, more deep healing sleep through the night. And the next day they awoke, feeling so refreshed and so wonderful, and carried on their usual day after day, as the season carried on. And as the season drew to a close, So the snow fox went back to that tree, waited at the tree for that red fox to awaken. And when the red fox awakened, that snow fox was there to greet it. And the red fox was surprised, had never seen a white fox before. Then the snow fox explained who they are. What things have been like while they've been asleep. And the red fox explained who they are. And what things are like when that snow fox isn't around. And the two of them normally went about their lives, not really interacting with others, but found this unusual friendship. 
and worked out how they could look forward to seeing each other at certain times. And how, because they lead different lives, they have plenty to talk about and plenty to build friendships around. And as snow cleared, so the woodland came alive with other birds and animals. colours came back to the woodland. The lake became the most beautiful blue. And that person enjoyed going out on the lake, relaxing in a boat, fishing on the lake, more for the relaxation than the fishing. And enjoyed reaching the end of a day. Sitting in the cabin, reading some book. Playing with and petting his gerbil. And going to bed and comfortably relaxing asleep, enjoying different dreams and different experiences. Relaxing and drifting so deeply asleep. So as you listen to me telling this story you can just take a moment to get yourself comfortable and to begin to relax and allow your eyes to close. And I don't know whether you'll relax deeper with the sound of my voice or the spaces between my words, or perhaps you'll relax deeper with each out breath that you take as you listen to this story in the background. And the story is about a child. And the child is out playing in the woods one day. They're running around in the woods. Running through the leaves of plants around the trees. Grabbing hold of tree trunks as they throw themselves around different directions, cracking twigs as they go, running through the undergrowth. And they can hear birds around them. They can hear the sounds of other animals. They can notice the way light occasionally shines through the treetops. And as they run around the trees, they can feel the bark of the trees under their hands. And smell that smell of the trees and feel each footstep as they run. And after a while they begin to get tired of all their running around, playing in the woods. So they find a tree. They jump up, grab a branch, pull themselves up, grab another branch, and start climbing up into that tree. And they carefully climb higher and higher into the tree. Climbing up into the branches so they can't be seen from the ground. They 
They then rest themselves on one of the branches, leaning with their back against the trunk of the tree. They attach themselves safely, securely to the tree as they've done many times before. And they begin to just sit and relax and listen to the sounds around them while they cool down from their playing. They listen to the birds in the distance how the birds seem to communicate with each other. They hear the rustling of the leaves as the wind blows a breeze. And they just allow themselves to relax. And while they relax, they get a teddy bear out of the backpack they've got with them. They rest that teddy bear on their lap. And as they relax, they just gaze at their teddy bear sitting on their lap, keeping them company helping them to relax deeper and more profoundly. And then snuggling their teddy bear, they close their eyes. And they begin to allow their mind to wander. Allow the mind to drift into a daydream. And as their mind starts drifting into a daydream, they begin to imagine themselves walking with their teddy in a computer game. And in this computer game, they climb up on blocks. They throw up whips that manage to hook onto ledges so they can swing from one ledge to another. And so they can climb up higher ledges, pull themselves up to those high ledges. And any bad guys that come along, Teddy fires out a big fist that knocks them down, and those bad guys disappear. And then Teddy jumps on the child's back, onto the child's shoulders, as the child climbs up walls, runs along ledges, Ducks, things that come at them, dodges, and acts out this video game. And the whole time the child's doing this, they can hear the video game music playing in the background. And they can tell what kind of environment they're in by the music that's playing. And every move they make, they find, has a musical sound. Whether it's Teddy throwing out a punch, whether it's jumping, ducking, firing their whip out to swing across gaps, or pull themselves up onto ledges. 
and in this video game they're heading for a hotel. And it's a spooky hotel. And as they get closer, they can tell that they're approaching that spooky hotel because of what it looks like around the hotel. It has that typical old school spooky hotel look on a computer game. And they run along the edge of the wall around the hotel. And then head into the entrance through the wall. Leading down a very long driveway to the hotel. And on arrival at the hotel, the music deepens and changes. And Teddy and the child enter the hotel. And they slowly begin to walk through the hotel. They can hear that repetitive music playing in the background. As they continue walking through that hotel. And the child jumps up on a ledge, runs along the ledge, fires their whip out, swings up to a higher ledge, runs along that ledge drops down onto a lower ledge, running along that ledge. Just like a 2D platform game. Sprinting, doing a long jump to the next ledge. And then the child comes to a ledge that they jump and fail. And they try again and they jump and they fail again. They try and fire out their whip, but the whip can't reach the other side. And they don't know what they're supposed to do. And they look around and they try and figure it out. And then after a while of jumping and trying to figure it out, the child notices a balloon just hanging in the air. So they jump up towards the balloon and the hand instinctively grabs the balloon, lifts them up higher and moves across. And they let go as they're over the ledge, landing the other side. And the child and Teddy work together as they continue through this hotel. Until eventually they reach a wall and they can see that there appears to be a passage up in that wall. And again the child runs and tries jumping and can't get up there. Tries using the whip and can't reach. Try searching around and then realises that they can move a chair near a table and so they move that chair over to the wall. They jump on the chair and then can jump up, use the whip to pull themselves up to that hole. They walk through the hole and having a sense of the screen sliding along. They move forward and drop down into a cavern and the music changes again. And in this cavern 
They see what they assume is the big bad boss of this game. And the boss starts leaping around. And the child throws Teddy off of his back. And then Teddy fires his fist at the big bad boss and the child jumps over the boss as the boss flies down towards him and lands and Teddy jumps back on his shoulders. And then the child runs across the floor, turns, throws Teddy off again. Teddy throws a punch at the boss, knocking the boss, the boss flashes. The child jumps over the boss again. Teddy jumps back on their shoulders again. Then the child jumps over the boss again, throws Teddy off. Teddy fires a punch at the boss. The boss flashes, stays stationary for a while and then flies down at them as the child jumps over them. Gets Teddy on his shoulders again. And they repeat this a number of times. Before all of a sudden the boss changes what they do. And they start heading left and right rather than diagonally down. And they start accelerating and becoming more erratic. And the child continues to jump the boss and run under the boss and throw Teddy off so that Teddy can throw a punch and then go and collect Teddy. And after a while, the boss flashes and flashes and flashes some more and then disappears and some pleasant music appears. And the child floats up into the air with Teddy on their back. And then the child finds themselves at what seems to be another level. And they find themselves on a rowing boat. And they've got that kind of 2D old school water. And they're rowing through that water. And Teddy has to throw punches forward to knock barrels that seem to be in front of the boat. To stop the boat from smashing into the barrels. And the child travels through the water. With that music in the background. With Teddy throwing punches at barrels as they appear in the water, suddenly popping up from under the surface. And then Teddy will throw a punch and throw another punch and the barrel will get destroyed. And there were some barrels that were a different colour that took a few more punches to be destroyed and would get closer to the boat before Teddy managed to destroy them. And then seagulls started diving down from the sky. They'd be flying left across the screen, so left above the child, and then right above the child. And then they would suddenly dive down on the child. And Teddy would throw a punch up at the seagulls as the child dodged the seagulls as they dive-bombed towards the sailboat and then after a while the seagulls disappeared the barrels disappeared and another boss appeared a boss in a floating flying machine that dived down towards them similar to the previous boss and they fought it in a similar way jumping over running under throwing Teddy off so that Teddy could throw some punches, 
collecting Teddy again, jumping over, dodging under. Teddy throwing some more punches, the boss flashing, jumping over, jumping under, the boss changing routine. Jumping and dodging this new routine of the boss. And this boss took longer and was a bit harder to defeat this time. But eventually, the boss flashed and flashed and then disappeared. And then the child realised that this next level was the final level of the game. And they knew that this level was different to the other levels. There wasn't a big boss at the end. And for this level, they had to work their way up a mountain. And so they started ascending that mountain. And they'd work their way along a path. They would jump over from one ledge to another, but the ledges were slippy, so they'd have to turn their back to the ledge and walk slightly the other way as they skidded along the ledge so they didn't fall off the end. And then they jump to another ledge and turn around, and jump to another ledge and turn around. And then some area, they'd have to fire their whip up at branches that stuck out and swing from one ledge to another. And then they'd have to use the whip to fire it up to higher ledges to pull themselves up and climb up the ledge. And then they'd have to jump up a slanted pathway run around a few more ledges, jumping from ledge to ledge, swinging in places, climbing up the sides of ledges in places. Until eventually, they reach the top of the mountain, after a lot of hard work. And at the top of a mountain was the temple, and they entered the temple door, and inside the temple, light flickered around the walls, and they walked through the temple. They could hear the rhythmic music in the background as they walked through that temple. And occasionally things would fly down at them and they'd have to duck and sometimes things would move at them that they would have to jump. And they had to jump from ledge to ledge at times. And duck and crawl under other bits at other times. And eventually they arrived at a room deep in this temple. They entered that room. And they saw a block of stone in the middle of the room. And they knew that what they had to do was carve a sculpture that had to be the perfect sculpture. And the only way to complete the level was to get that sculpture right. And they had to work out what the sculpture was supposed to look like. So they started exploring the walls, looking at the images on the walls. Trying to work out the codes, trying to work out the pattern of what was on the walls. And they started moving squares around, moving bits and pieces around on those walls. Trying to make it fit and make it look like 
a pattern that they can carve. They moved some bits up and left, some bits down and right. And then they would stand back and take a look, and then move forward and move some more bits, trying to line up all the different lines that were on the movable squares. Until eventually they managed to make it so it looked like what they imagined the sculpture has to look like. And then they went over to the sculpture and they knew that that sculpture had to look like what the image looked like from the perspective from two foot marks on the floor. So they started chipping away, carving away at that sculpture until eventually they managed to make it look like the image on the wall. And as soon as it looked like the image on the wall, so the temple seemed to fall away. A bright white beam of light shone down from above onto the sculpture and seemed to send out beams of light in all directions like light reflecting off of mirrors. And the music changed. And that light seemed to spread out in all directions into the land. And then a trophy started descending through that light until it was just above the sculpture And the child lifted Teddy up over their head. And Teddy reached for the trophy, took the trophy. And passed the trophy down to the child. And the child told Teddy how they'd earned that trophy together. They couldn't have done it without each other. And then this video game began to disappear. And the child shifted a little bit on that branch as their eyes began to open. And they found themselves resting in that tree, Teddy on their lap, feeling good feeling comfortable, feeling a sense of achievement, of accomplishment. Looking at Teddy, smiling, placing Teddy back in their bag, descending the tree, wandering back through the woods, finding their way back to the path that leads out of these woods, following that path, playing that computer game over in their mind as they walk, humming the music to the game, reliving the experience in their mind's eye. And they go home, they have tea, and then that evening they settle down in bed, and they begin to drift comfortably asleep, dreaming about their experience, about that daydream about what else they can daydream, what other adventures they can go on with Teddy as they drift and float and fall comfortably and relaxed asleep.